Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, December 23rd, 2021. The last live show of the year. Ho, ho, ho. My name is... Please, this is an anti-Christmas show. How dare you? My name is Emma Bigland and for Sam Cedar. And this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Brandon Sutton and Matt Binder. Ever heard of them? They'll be joining us for the entire show. Meanwhile, the Biden administration has announced a freeze on student loan payments until May 1st, affecting 41 million borrowers. Now it's time to pressure him into canceling all student debt. The FDA has approved the first pill to fight COVID called Paxlovid. It's got a rhyme, right? And developed by Pfizer for high risk patients 12 years and older. A clinical trial shows it's highly effective if taken after you feel sick, as soon as symptoms start. And Pfizer claims it is still effective against Omicron. And speaking of Omicron, South African scientists say that the variant cases may have peaked as case counts have been falling and are down by 20% since last week. This comes as initial research suggests that Omicron may be less severe in the resulting illness than previous variants. And the Supreme Court has said it will hold a special session at the start of January on two Biden vaccine and testing mandates. One for healthcare workers and one that requires shots and testing for employees at larger shots or testing, I should say, for employees at larger companies. The New York Times is reporting that FBI agents infiltrated the Black Lives Matter protests in Portland with, quote, extensive surveillance, which I'm just aghast by. Our patriotic G-men, how dare they? But they were totally taken off guard by January 6th. And lastly... The Biden administration tweaked sanctions imposed against the Taliban to leave wiggle room for aid groups to get money into Afghanistan, which is on the brink of severe drought, famine, and other crises. It's not enough, though. We need reparations for the Afghan people and the Iraqi people, for that matter. All this and more on today's program welcome to the show ladies and gentlemen it is as i mentioned the final live show of 2021 and here with me is sam cedar ah, obviously, obviously. I, we uh we're a bit technologically i mean lazy i might say we could change the fact that you there on zoom it says sam cedar but i don't know if we need to i don't think you should I yeah. think that, you know, a lot of people have been calling for it and it's, it's gone. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, so as you can see, Brandon, oh, fixed. Wow. Uh, Look at that. A little bit of magic. Silence once again. Um, I don't know. Is Binder going to be joining us soon? Uh, yep. As soon as he gets in, I, I accidentally <laughs> sent the link to the wrong place, it's, but it's, hopefully he, it, it, it's all good. He has it. We'll see. Uh, he should be here in a few minutes. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, it's a, it's a treat to have you on in the first hour of this program, which is supposed to be a bit more serious. It is a treat to be on. It's also a treat to be here in person. I know a lot of people probably, uh, are just listening over, um, you know, whatever their podcasting platform of choice is, but this is, you know, one of the first times I've been in the majority studio since the COVID pandemic started mm. my, uh, second second time meeting Emma in person. You know? I know. The so. last time you witnessed it on air. I mean, we have been it, it, it's jarring, right? I was so we were saying before the show it's sensory overload because I've only seen a, a two-dimensional version of you. Yeah, and now everyone gets to see, you know, me in all my glory. Right. Well, I mean, exactly. Uh and oh, here uh Bender's here. So let's Hello. let's bring him in. Let's bring him in. 
Oh. All right. Whoa. Look at that. I don't know what's wrong with my camera, but I'm glad you're fixing it. Here we go. Uh, and here's Matt. Here's hey, Matt. Matt. Oh, hello, everybody. How are you doing? Oh, Brendan, it's so nice to see you here with, in the studio with us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I do. Uh, I am always in awe of that. that green screen is pretty good. That green screen is pretty good, Bender. It is. It is. I'm quite proud of it. And all I did was take a photo of uh, your very background back in geez, January of 2020, the last time I was there. Oof, mm. I know. We were just mm. kind of reckoning with the fact that it's been this long and it seems to never be ending. Never does ending. Any, does this happen to anyone else when you think like when you try to think, oh, what was I doing last year? you like sort of forget that like i automatically think back to like march 2020 as if that was the last like that as, as if that's still a year ago like i feel like everything after that has been in some weird like time hold i don't know just yeah. it just feels weird i don't remember what i did last christmas for instance definitely not oh my god yeah when you put it like that it's been flattened because i stayed here i'm pretty sure i think yeah I feel like a lot of it has to do with, you know, the first nine or so months of the pandemic, we were all on the edge of our seats because we were kept under this kind of weird umbrella of two weeks from now, things are going to be back to normal. Mm -hmm. And so by the time we got out of the summer and that just wasn't the case, we kind of entered into that, like everyone is dying phase of the pandemic and we don't know what we're going to do. That happened towards the last, you know, fall and winter. And so it was kind of easy to fall out of, I don't know, step with time. I, I thought about this the other day. What if you had told us that it would be December of 2021 in March of 2020 and we'd still be dealing with this? I mean, what would what what would my reaction would have been? Uh, I, I don't know. I might have had a panic attack. And there were people that were saying that, too. There were. And I yeah. think that's important to highlight. There were people who were saying that, but they were kind of drowned out by other you know people arguing their own expertise who were saying that well yeah the science and doctors might say it's going to take two to three years to go back to normal but your boss says you have to be back in the office <laughs> by august 27th <laughs> so at the end of the day who who's the real expert right i i feel like we would be uh committing some sort of heinous crime if we didn't uh discuss right here at this very moment that classic Elon Musk tweet where he uh, he <laughs> said that we would have uh, zero cases by April of 2020. <laughs> oh, don't worry. We will be getting to Elon Musk later in the program. But I do want to start uh, off with this story that came out of the New York Times um, earlier today on the FBI and their surveillance of the Black Lives Matter protests in Portland. Um, so, I mean, media critique can be lowest common denominator sometimes of leftist discourse, but I do think that focusing somewhat on how the New York Times frames this and, and debunking it a bit is instructive and important for people to understand. So it should not be a shock to anybody that FBI agents were monitoring Black Lives Matter protests throughout the country. They've been doing that before the murder of George Floyd. They were involved in Black Lives Matter uh, monitoring. That's been documented to this point. Yeah, Matt? Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, they're, they've been an American Gestapo since um, basically the uh, uh, formation of it since right. J. Edgar Hoover. So, yeah, continue. So, the, But this is good reporting by the New York Times. So, however, again, I'm going to they, they treat it as an aberration of what the FBI engages in when it's, in fact, incredibly consistent. The FBI set up extensive surveillance operations inside Portland's protest movement, according to documents obtained by the New York Times and current and former federal officials, with agents standing shoulder to shoulder with activists, tailing vandalism suspects, it's a great use of federal resources, to guide the local police toward arrests, and furtively videotaping inside one of the country's most active domestic protest movements. The breadth of the FBI involvement in Portland and other cities where federal teams were deployed at street protests became a point of concern for some within the Bureau and the Justice Department, who worried that it could undermine the First Amendment right to protest against the government, according to two officials familiar with the discussions, who clearly must be the sources, uh, the source for this New York Times reporting. Some within the departments worried that the teams could be compared to FBI surveillance transgressions of decades past, such as COINTELPRO projects that sought to spy on, spy on and disrupt various activist groups in the 1950s and 1960s, according to the officials, one current and one former who spoke on conditions of anonymity because they were not authorized to discuss the debate. So that's what frustrates me here, too. There has been monitoring of Black Lives Matter before 
before George Floyd's, Floyd's murder, as I mentioned. There was an FBI informant who uh, basically uh, coaxed Red Fawn Thales into uh, using one of his guns so uh, and, and for for holding it and because they had a romantic relationship essentially and then she she was penalized for that she went to jail because of that the that was iraq war movement we, yes we know like massive surveillance i mean this is just like, muslim like, muslim mosques yeah. muslim groups environmental uh, groups environmental groups peace activists uh uh pro-palestinian groups this is not this is the norm this is the norm uh, i didn't mean to cut you off matt Oh no! I was just gonna say we had that whistleblower, and I was I was gonna look up his name. I keep forgetting it, but out of Minneapolis FBI, who's basically like, yeah, I was meant, I was just driving around in uh, FBI uh, SUVs all the time, tailing like um, Muslim like care, uh, right? Like those sort that that group like uh, um, tailing them to see if they were up to like some terrorism and stuff like that, and then trying to entrap other folks. If you can get them on the line for some smaller offense, then you can get them to inform on their community. That happened widely in uh, Minneapolis and. And many other communities, obviously, um, um, New, um, New York and New Jersey. Abolish ICE too. protest is another good example of where there was FBI, act FBI activity. And then there's just one more paragraph, and then I want to ask you guys about what your thoughts are. Um, there has been no evidence so far that the Bureau used similar surveillance teams on right-wing demonstrators during the January 6th riot at the U.S. Capitol, despite police uh, potential threats of violence against the heart of the federal government. Though the FBI did have an informant in the crowd that day, whoa, geez. The Bureau has at times used secretive tactics to disrupt right-wing violence, such as efforts that led to charges against men accused of conspiring to kidnap Michigan's governor. And so, like, a lot of people I'm seeing this morning are comparing and talking about the hypocrisy of the fact that there was not enough resources deployed on January 6th. And, like, that's a fine point to make. But the point that I think should be at the forefront of this is that, no, uh, infiltration of and disruption of left-wing movements has always been one of the primary objectives of the FBI. And this is just consistent with it as opposed to, as I mentioned earlier, some sort of aberration. Terry Albury is the name of the FBI whistleblower who, uh, um, people should look up that story. Anyway. It's always, it's always super, uh, fun for me. It's like, uh, it's like, uh, you know, whenever whenever conservatives start talking about, you know, their their current push is that the FBI completely manufactured January sixth, again, uh, which completely flies in the face of the information that we have, where even the FBI was like saying we were pretty much hands off, other than that person who was like in the crowd, uh, just like you know, surveying the situation, um, and then also when it comes to like you know, uh, uh, deplatforming and cutting off like. Uh, uh, conservative uh, online networks or channels or or accounts or whatever, you're always like, oh yeah, you don't care about this left leftist because it doesn't happen to you. Like, where well, wait till it comes for you? And it's always like, no, no, no. See, it's the other way around. This stuff has <laughs> been happening to leftists forever, forever. And you were the ones who didn't care back when it was happening to the left. You didn't care when it was the FBI. Uh, surveillancing, uh, you know, uh, uh, civil rights protests uh, and uh, anti-war movement protests. You didn't care about any of that stuff. And then it came uh, almost, you know, very little came for you. But still, you guys can't even handle that little bit. And you're trying to pretend like you're the like, you know, you're the first, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ones affected by it. It's just not the case. It's just not the case. But, you know, that's yeah, what we see now. I think that's a dangerous, it's a dangerous logic because it says like, uh, if you don't make the right wing the face of all the the victims of this sort of stuff, uh, then you have it coming, leftists, mm -hmm. when we've had, we can, we have it coming, right? It's coming and coming and coming for ever since these organizations, they, that's, we, this, like, these politics are who they exist to suppress. Well, yeah, and I think that goes to Emma's point. This stuff is always happening and, and only sometimes re-enters the news. You know, it sometimes re-enters the news as a story like this that, you know, comes out maybe six months, a year, two years later, and is therefore able to be framed as like, this is something the FBI did in the past, and now they are no longer doing it. Uh, but, you know, we have to be aware of the dangers of overreach, because ultimately the people who are most likely to be platformed by like mainstream or have their stories, you know, inflated as though they are the sort of in 
rather indicative of the entire problem are right wingers. You know, they're the people who are going to end up in New York Times articles after they get, you know, unjustly deplatformed for, I don't know, having an anti having an anti black podcast at their job or something and, or like being a January 6th. We're going to hear stories after story about all of the, you know, all of the um uh, sentencing of the January 6th protesters and it's going to be framed as isn't this a little bit of overreach isn't this you know too harsh isn't this that or that and it's like yeah I agree that every any sentence in America is a little too harsh uh, but we can't pre pretend like it's an anomaly if anything it's anomalously it's only anomalous in how far they were able to get and how little punishment they're actually getting which doesn't mean we should advocate for more punishment or become like a you know this is like tit for tat thing but it is to acknowledge that like matt said we can't just allow it to be framed as this is not happening already and every time like a right winger at new york times gets or loses their job because they like, can't stop posting like uh neo-nazi propaganda online we go is what if this happens to a black person <laughs> it's just like it's a, it's a, and then stairs in mark lamont hill <laughs> I remember when they were first starting to punch Nazis, you know, no matter how you feel about that. And I was like, I don't really care if they punch Nazis. And someone literally asked me, well, how would you feel if people hated you just because of like, you know, what, who you were? And I was like, this is how far like we've gotten. <laughs> this is how far like the narrative online of like the real, the, you know, this is sort of, um, I think, mentality that the left, because it's cooler online than the far right generally, that we control everything. And so, like, people are just allowed to live in that narrative and they just tell people, like, well, what if communists were the victims of the same kind of oppression like what? rich people were in America? So, okay, well, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I mean, again, that's just uh, it shouldn't come to a shock as any to anybody that this was the kind of activity that we were seeing. But I think it's you know, important that we highlighted it. Highlight. I mean, we all we, we all know the first line of that cra that classic saying: uh, first they came for the Trump supporters, and mm -hmm. I did not speak out." That's that is the original line that we all yes. forget. First they came for the small business owners, and I said, right? <laughs> and I said, "Pay your employees fifteen dollars an hour, and yeah. also provide health insurance." And they, and they said they can't because you know all seven of the Denny's they own in that Iowa county just don't make that much money. And it's difficult to clean your pool if yeah. that's the case. Yeah. I, I, yeah. uh, we have to take a quick break. When we come back, we will have more show for you. <laughs> Folks, if you're looking for the perfect last minute holiday gift, check this out. One of our sponsors is Shaker and Spoon. It is a monthly cocktail subscription box that delivers the ingredients and recipes for amazing craft cocktails and it's right to your door. Now look, I am a, a cocktail uh, skeptic because I don't like sweet things. And Me I don't, neither. And I don't like those, but they sent us a thing. What? What? what they sent um, a a box, and I took the one for Mezcal. Bradley took the one for what? Rye. Yep. Okay. Right. And um, so, if you go right now to shakerandspoon.com/majority, they'll give you twenty bucks off. This is what it does. Each monthly box comes with three different original cocktail recipes and enough ingredients for twelve cocktails, four from each recipe. So you get to you know you get to mix and you play around, but. Um, and a lot of the ingredients they send is stuff that's hard to find on your own. There was stuff that I'd never even heard of. Like this botanical sort of like spray that you did at the end. Um, the, I love mez mezcal, so that's very exciting for me. This was really good, actually. And the sizes are small, so you can have a taste of something you haven't uh, uh, tried before instead of having to commit to a full bottle of something that you might end up only using once. It's good. This is the thing about it that I really like. It introduces you to flavor combinations and... Uh, I guess ingredients like, you know, uh, not just like, you know, like orange bitters or like this fl uh, floral stuff that I had in the mezcal um, and the recipe cards. Like I say, I don't like uh, sweet uh, cocktails. So you're able to sort of like measure how much you're going to put in. Uh, literally last night, I went over and this is actually going to be big, I think, over the next couple of months because... I ain't going to a bar. 
Yeah, uh, you know, unless like we get another like night where it's like 55 degrees. I'm not going inside to a bar. Right. And so uh, I think, you know, within your pod of people, going and having a cocktail night is going to be fun. But the thing for me that I like about it is that I learned about like, I don't like the botanical spray. Okay. But I like the other stuff. Like I, and so I made it once with the spray. You just do it a couple of times. Um, and, uh, but I like the bitters and I like this and it really actually made like a delicious cocktail. And then I was like, now I know if I go out and I see like this, uh, you know, uh, this ingredient or that ingredient, I know like make it without that. It just adds a certain sophistication to it. So, uh, you know, Shaker Spoon is now giving Majority Report listeners 20 bucks off your first box when you go to shakerandspoon.com slash majority, or you can just click the link in the description that's shakerandspoon.com slash majority for 20 bucks off your first box of delicious cocktails. Check it out. And they have different ones. They have mezcal, they have rye. I think there are other things that you can use uh, that are based on a different liquor. Uh, but those are my two favorite, I got to say. Check it out. Shakerandspoon.com slash majority. We are back. We are back. Thank you, Sam, for that advertisement from the past. Um, Donald Trump is like the the being accidentally right today. That's kind of the theme of the show. There's we have some clips of him saying things that are just like a little bit too on track for uh, for comfort. But let's start here. So he's a, he's in Merry Christmas mode. Remember, he brought back Christmas, mm -hmm. and he's feeling the holiday spirit, which means suddenly, like the ghost of Christmas, whatever whatever the good one is, the uh, Pat Christmas Vax. Yes, that that one has come, and the ghost of Christmas Vax has made Donald Trump right for the season. Is he is he going off on like a uh, shower pressure again? Because I always felt he was right about that one. So. <laughs> I remember that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Toilets just don't flush the way they used to. And the light bulb one. And the wash and dryers aren't don't dry as well. Yeah. Um, uh, as Binder... if he doesn't get every item of his clothing dry cleaned. No, I'm sitting there next to the dryer waiting for it, looking at my watch, being like, oh, I'm, my socks are almost done. Binder, you kind of, you tipped uh, one of the videos we haven't watched yet, which is the him and Huckabee saving Christmas, but we'll have to play that maybe after. Oh, yeah. okay. Right. I actually, I, <laughs> I enjoy that video so much. That uh, I actually oh, played it's the best it video of the year. Two <laughs> separate, two separate episodes of my own show. So, <laughs> like, I, I did so much. Night. I had to, I had to like do like a replay. Like I did it last Thursday with my guest Parker Malloy, and then this uh, past Tuesday, I was like, you know what? It was so good. We all got to watch it again. It's yeah. that great. And then we're gonna do it again on the show. I, I haven't seen it yet. But yeah, it is the season. It, yeah. was, it was legit. The left reckoning cold open last night. <laughs> <laughs> well. So Donald Trump is uh, trying to put his face back out there. And I mean, I think he's likely to run in 2024. At the very least, he wants people to speculate about whether he's going to run in 2024. But right now he's doing what kind of reminds me of like how he aggressively went after the Iraq war in the Republican primary leading up to 2016, where none of the other Republican politicians wanted to go there, basically. But because it was a common sense thing and because he said it so aggressively and because the base loves him pretty much regardless and he can just say what's on his mind they appreciate his off the cuff nature like it's going to go over fine he's going to face zero repercussions for touting the vaccine so this is a clip of him with candace owens here in keeping with his uh what what was the Bill O'Reilly tour he was doing the other day where he talked about how he got the booster? Take credit, okay? Take credit for the booster and other vaccines, yes. which is code for give me credit. Don't let them take the credit away from me. <laughs> <laughs> and he's and he's continuing uh, in that vein here because he wants to seize the credit for the vaccine back from uh from biden and also i mean i think he's just like these people are being so stupid like i like the vax and and is in favor of it he triples down here with candace owens 
terms of big pharma, which is a huge topic on the minds of, of mothers, especially you're seeing what's happening at these school board meetings. Where do you stand on these vaccine mandates? And obviously, I know that you are you are pro vaccine. Obviously, you did everything you could to get this vaccine out. I know it was where you one stand of the, the vaccine. greatest achievements. We did it in less than nine months and to be able to do that. Yeah, but where, but now it's years. taken a twist, right? It's, it's gotten now we went from this is a good thing and people should have this option mm -hmm to military men, you're going to have to resign yeah. because you're, you're not getting this vaccine. Where do you stand yeah. on that? Well, I stand on, forget about the mandates that people have to have their freedom, but yeah. at the same time, the vaccine is one of the greatest achievements of <laughs> mankind. We would have had a 1917, remember the Spanish flu, killed okay, perhaps it. 100 it million second. people. All right, so just a reminder, and you can just keep this up, Bradley, it's just like one aside. He was talking about how this is no worse than the flu i mean it's the flu no one's gonna die it's not that serious unless you're a fatty unless you're a fatty and unless you're an oldie uh and unless you're a poorie you're not gonna get uh, be affected by covid and now it could have been worse than the, the spanish flu all right i mean it's amazing when you look at history <laughs> you, you don't want to go out like stan that's just the truth you don't want to go out like stan all right, <laughs> all right continue <laughs> Actually, it ended the First World War because the soldiers were so. A lot of people don't know that. The soldiers got so sick, it was a terrible thing. There were no vaccines. There were no anything. I came up with a vaccine, with three vaccines. All are very, very good. Came up with three of them in less than nine months. It was supposed to take five to 12 years. And, and yet we more saved... people have died under COVID this year, by the way, yeah. under Joe Biden, right. than under you. And more people took the vaccine this year. So people are questioning how... Well, no, the vaccine worked, but yeah. some people aren't taking it. The ones, the ones that get very sick and go to the hospital are the ones that don't take the vaccine. But it's still their choice. And if you take the vaccine, you're protected. Look, the results of the vaccine are very good. And if you do get it, it's a very minor form. People aren't dying when they take the vaccine. What about they, the masking of children? That's that's a big I, one I for moms right now. I think it's a terrible right thing. I think it's a terrible subject. thing. That flies in the face of science. The kids have a virtual 0% right. chance of dying of COVID, and yet they're insisting on these vaccine mandates. I mean, I'm sorry, on these um, masking mandates. She really wanted him to get off that point. That is not yeah. the only reason, though. Like, yeah. Like, you spread it to other people. Yeah, you spread it, it to other people. Exactly. Like, there, again, globally, uh, some like 5 million children uh, have the experience of being COVID orphans, like losing all guardians. Domestically because... in the United States, it's like 140,000. Yeah, it's just insane. But that's still virtually zero by our population. So it's not that, you know, technically right, it's less exactly. than 1%. Right. Thank you, Brett. I, I also Statistically, you Statistically, that. it's zero. Statistically, 3 million Americans dying is only like less than 1% of Americans dying. So that's not that many. All right, wait, but I guess also, we'll uh, also tell the that statistic to uh, someone who has lost a child from COVID because there have been very, yes, there's been a lot less, but there have been children who have died from COVID. Or, they don't or permanently, like, or or at least long term complications from it. Yeah. Well, we you know we don't platform those people. Yeah. We platform the people who are arguing kind of abstractly about whether you and you should go back to work uh, and be exposed to illness, and therefore your kids have to go back to public school. And you know the mothers or children who lose their parents are just like, well, they're externalities of that system. Well, I mean, it's like that. Trump would be the kind of guy that if your kid has a peanut allergy, it's like, and, or, and Candace Owens, like, God, they're being so annoying not allowing peanuts in schools like ugh, those kids are the weaklings basically if you're you have a pre-existing condition and you get COVID as a kid kind of natural you know that that's nature taking its course but it's also just hashtag true that, save the children it's also true that Trump is not a fan of his fans like the Trump is just has never been a yeah. fan of his more rabid even like right wing you know apart from Fox News and OANN and whatever thing he's going on it's a kind of a traditional news channel like he's never been a real big fan of all of that kind of like real uh QAnon left and not like a uh, far right like demagogue like he thinks they're you know low class well because everybody in his st class status is vaccinated yeah, i mean he, and, and they, they they see no issue with it like he's a classic kind of like old school conservative who wants to be the representative of these people but Maybe really just can't not yeah. really can't actually bring himself to pretend like he respects them in any real way yeah right um, but he can't push them away either though he knows yeah. that like anytime there's been a chance for him to like refute refute someone he would he throws that chance away because he wants those QAnon people he wants the anti-vaxxers like look all the little addendums he had to add you know the vaccine's great you won't you know you you 
almost for sure won't die if you take it, but it's your freedom. You got, if you got freedom, you can't, if you don't want to take it, you shouldn't be forced to take it. Of course. Don't, don't get me wrong there. He's got to add something to throw those people a bone because he doesn't want to lose them. No matter how much he dislikes them or even hates some of them, he still wants them. Yeah. Making an issue of personal choice is a great way to like, just give it a type of legitimacy and like traditional American like values, even though it's like incredibly acontextual. I think he's angling to get back on Twitter. I think this is like his way of being responsible Ooh. enough to get back on mainstream channels. But, you know, I don't think it's going to work. Funny thing is Twitter's the one company. Well, maybe with a new CEO, who knows? But Twitter's the one company who has been out there who has stated like, period, we are not bringing him back. Like Facebook has the whole kicking it down the curb to the oversight board and the oversight board forcing them to give it a time frame and they give it like a two year time frame or something and then they'll reassess the situation. Twitter's the only one who is like, no, nah, he's, he's not coming back. But again, new CEO, who knows? Just a, uh, a a note here. Candace Owens' first tweet about uh, Big Pharma was in April of this year. So <laughs> can we can we say is, is there anything left in that clip, Bradley? I mean, they just talk about masking. But if you want to, right. yeah. Uh, well, then there we go. Yeah. Per, um... Take credit, Candace. <laughs> The only reason he doesn't like masks is because he didn't make them. Like if he he could like yeah. if he was like I up the production for the masks, they were my idea. Then he would be like, no, Candace, the masks are great. All children should be wearing them. Your children's children should be wearing them. Masks for everyone, like that. But he didn't. He has nothing to do with masks, so he doesn't care. Let's just like notice how Candace really shot her shot trying to say that uh, more people are vaccinated and more people are dying means that people that are vaccinated are dying. Like she actually tried that with Trump, and in the moment he said no. No, yeah. No, for him, man. I mean, I mean, the reason if if we need he's not going to be bullied by her. Like he's he knows he's the big dog in that situation. He's not going to like subscribe to her fact pattern. He's never done that with any but any media member. He dictates the terms. Because and also that implies that the vaccine is what's killing people, or like exactly. it's not working, and that's his vaccine. For the, at the end of the day, he at right. least has responsibility for the you know for like the marvel of modern science that he's describing of creating a functional or three functional vaccines that you know work within basically not six to nine months and getting them off the ground everything else after that failed <laughs> but you know you know and that before part, that and before great. that yeah <laughs> but the science was something good you know he frames it like he did it himself like he was in the lab with the scientists and making the vaccine himself but you know you can't deny it was a marvel of modern science too bad it had to be done through like the veil of you know private capitalism and all that stuff well that's the funny thing about that mo marvel of modern science is that mrna technology has been kicking around for a while yeah. but we only like activated it now in case of emergency and in case of you know governments forcing these companies to save us yeah and speaking of like marvels of modern science again we don't have like independent uh understandings of what cuba's vaccine actually in terms of its efficacy but they have vaccinated 83 percent of their population and 90 percent have one shot at least um so doesn't need to be capitalist in order to actually create something that's gonna going to make uh you know inoculate people and, and push public health forward obviously also there's a there's a number of reasons i just want to put this out there because who knows who's watching this show and i don't want anyone getting the wrong idea from what candace owens just said but there are many reasons why uh there are more deaths under biden than trump that have nothing to do actually with either president really uh for number one uh Trump got lucky and sort of avoided the winter months for the most part when it came to COVID. You, you know, we didn't get hit. The uh, U.S. didn't get hit till like mid-March of 2020. Winter was pretty much over. Uh, we know that the winter months are when COVID's at its worst. Biden, uh, you know, uh, inaugurated into office January 20th. So, the, you know, pretty much he has to deal with that plus this winter. Um, and then on top of that, we had we have variants now. And then on top of that, for the uh, early months of COVID, like March, April, May, uh, we were like locked down and mostly not going out. Biden's presided over all the reopenings and everything. Uh, people getting vaccinated, so more people going out and doing things, you know, events happening again. So those unvaxxed people are mingling with those, uh, you know, with all the stuff that is reopened again, but they didn't get any of the protections that the vaccinated people do, so they're getting sicker. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why there are more more deaths now, honestly. It's because we're do like basically following what the, their prescribed policy. Right. Um, 
choice would be. And it is dangerous when when the, all that is glossed over and this is just collapsed as authoritarian power grab. So like immediately from the vaccine, if you think the vaccines are part of an authoritarian power grab, you're not criticizing Big Pharma, Candace Owens or Charlie Kirk or any other people who are doing that. Um, what you're doing is basically uh, defanging any efforts to try to force these companies to share IP and knowledge with other countries to allow them to build it. Because why would you want to help other countries uh, and know how to make these vaccines if if they're just authoritarian power grabs and you can't trust them right um and then there's the other thing where it's like um basically like the when i he see the right talk about the authoritarian i see they're really upset that we paid people to stay home like bender mentioned and now that they're fine they're having uh, uh they're finding it tough to fill those jobs at the lower wages that they had and that's authoritarianism to them yeah I will say at least Trump, I mean, we're all forgetting that in the latter half of last, I mean, the last quarter of last year, Trump was uh, recovering from COVID himself. So he didn't really have a chance to, you know, be out there as much uh, rabble rousing, but also like- Just breathing weirdly on camera. <laughs> oh yeah. But also, I mean, you know, it's a good thing he has at least moved past like promoting like bleach or hydroxychloroquine or whatever other kinds of like uh, prophylactic things that he was pushing in the beginning. It's so, like sort of half-heartedly before there was a vaccine. Right. Well, let's maybe just stay on the Trump train then, shall we? Uh, I'm so actually, I am actually surprised he hasn't gone out there and been like, my good friend Joe Rogan says Regeneron's great. Should be. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm curious if there's ever going to be a crossover event in that area. I mean, we I covered this on the show yesterday, but ba uh, there are three man mo monoclonal antibody treatments. Uh, only one of them works for Omicron. And it's basically out of stock in all of New York. And it's likely to be, uh, it, 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 say if you're Joe Rogan, if you're somebody who's wealthy, you have access to Regeneron or to, to a monoclonal antibody treatment if you want. But hospitals are not giving it out right now because yeah. they're so overfilled. They could just use uh, ivermectin. That too, right. That's a joke, uh, you, uh, Google sensors, YouTube sensors. Although, I mean, uh, it's unclear <laughs> what this new COVID pill is gonna cost. Um, the government is going to buy some portion of it, but it's certainly not, I don't think it's going to be free like the vaccine. Um, and it's thus far probably only, I think, available to around 10 million Americans based on pre-existing conditions, including if you're 12 and up. Um, so children are going to have access to it as well. But it's, it's, I, I'm curious about how they're going to price it because it's, the, the, they could gouge and... It, I don't see the Biden administration standing up to Pfizer in this area. Um, but yeah, let's move on to this other Trump clip here, because this actually came out yesterday, Binder, and I considered playing it on the show, and I said, no, no, this is the kind of thing I save specifically for you. Specifically uh, for you. that. Um, Donald Trump, again, theme of the show, being accidentally right, but not really for using the right logic to get to the place that we kind of all are at. He thinks crypto is BS. As his wife, because they spend so much time together, I'm sure it's just like the result of ideological debate um, and robust and and uh, debate that's based on the foundation of respect. But she's getting into the NFT game. Trump doesn't seem to have the same opinion of the crypto NFT world that she probably uh, has. Come on, first lady. Really what do you think it. about crypto? Because, you know, New York and Miami is yeah. really getting cryptocurrency into their financial system. Well, I never loved it because I like to have the dollar. I think the currency should be the dollar. So I was never a big fan, but it's building up bigger and bigger and nobody's doing anything about it. And uh, it's uh, <laughs> I, I know it so well. Look, I want a currency called what? the dollar. I don't want to have all these others, and that could be an explosion someday, like the likes of which we've never seen. It'll make the big tech explosion yep. look like like baby stuff. Uh, I think it's a very dangerous thing. Let me. Ask He's talking about the uh, dot com bubble of the two thousands, obviously, when right. we ex yeah. it was the explosion. Yeah. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, wow, uh, uh, Trump is correct about his uh, his dislike for crypto. I, I love to hear it. Love to hear it. Uh, and as he said himself, I know this very of, well. <laughs> but not because of the dollar, right? I mean, that's of what's course, so... Of it's, course, of course. Anyway, keep going. I mean, I, I, it's, yeah, now, do we have... How did that come up? Because it, it seems like they were discussing Melania's NFT project. What did he say about... What did he have to say about that specifically? Or they didn't, they didn't really cover that? 
I think uh, like in light of uh, Melania's NFT project, what do you think about crypto sort of? Thing? Oh, oh, well, I, you know, that's funny because uh, once again, Donald Trump has got to uh, disagree with Melania on something. It doesn't seem like they're very much in common. I don't know how, you know, how that relationship even lasts. Uh, but anyway, I mean, we know how it lasts. We know how yeah, it lasts. I mean, I know how it lasts on Melania's side of things, but you know, <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I don't really get what his uh, dislike for crypto is, though. It seems like it'd be the perfect grift for him. I mean, it sounds like it's just one of those things where Donald Trump just likes the old school. Like he's a very like traditional, classic guy. And I don't mean in like a religious sense or even a conservative sense. He just likes like things how it was back when he was growing up. Like he's nostalgic. Um, so you know, changing well, it. So that's really what it sounds like. Look at That's how really... he decorates his like palace. He wants to right. be in Versailles. He wants, and, and I mean, he's like a cartoon character, rich person. He's like how he's someone... forever stuck in the eighties. It seems right, like. right, exactly. Yeah. He, you know, he's nostalgic for the scams of his day when he was pulling real estate scams in New York City and you know undercutting like development costs and all that other stuff. This is sort of new like late 2000s uh or not late 2000s yeah late 2000s uh, internet scam stuff that's just beyond his time i mean he's part of that generation of like older uh ceos who are still having their like websites printed out for them at work and they're still in charge of the company and they're like in their 70s and 90s and they've been in charge of the company for 40 years and so i mean those people aren't the ones who are interested in crypto or like in or even really susceptible to like a lot of the buzzwords that float around crypto because that's more aimed at like you know the millennial late gen x like tech generation of like one day you're going to be an internet billionaire just like steve jobs and it's just like i you know, I think that he, you know, he knows it's a scam because he, you know, a scam can, a scam artist can smell a good scam, right. but it's not a scam for him. You know, it's not a scam that he's interested in promoting. It's a, yeah, his sites are higher. It's the interesting thing about Trump that he does all these like, like petty little gr grifts, right? But he's always had an eye on like global currency markets and stuff like that, like how we're doing. Um, And then like, that is like not the reason I care about it. Like, right, like the, which basically like anti-inflation hawks, um, uh, uh, like why they might also want the dollar just to be um but like i i mean i think it's like when he's talking about the explosion he's absolutely right because no, no value is being created you're not gonna be able to sell an electronic like cartoon uh a monkey uh for millions of dollars in 15 years yeah and also like he has a very low class person's idea of what like class is so he's not going to go he goes out of his way to like yeah gild everything in gold and have right, like right. you know uh like classical looking paintings of himself he's not going to like hang up a lazy lion nft yeah. much less know what that is because it's like this is ugly this doesn't look like well it's his, 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 his wealth is, his wealth is so much about the his presentation yeah. of wealth like he he's wants he, part of why he like he, how he built his identity is on being i'm the rich guy with my name on the buildings and it's going to be in gold like that's really what so much of his identity is tied to so something that's more opaque i guess like a scam that's involves a kind of cartoon or whatever that's not something he's that interested in right and you know he's sort of hung up on the idea that i mean they're called cryptocurrency and you have you know a country like el salvador actually adopting bitcoin as an actual national currency but he's hung up on that idea that like oh the big bitcoin or some other crypto is going to replace the dollar um but you know to me that's not even like the more uh, you know, the, the more uh, worrisome uh, critique right now, like obviously maybe that could happen in the future if it continues to blow up. But, you know, right now crypto is trying to, uh, A, change how the internet works. I'm sure, you know, Trump doesn't really care about that so much. And, um, you know, do we really want everything to be monetized like that? We want everything to be commodified. Is everything we do online an asset? Is everything we uh, do online, do we want it put on a blockchain, never to be removed, forever there, yeah, inscribed? Exactly. Like, I want, the... all, I want everything I do to be put on the blockchain for privacy. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I think when you think about like the way we've been moving with the internet, especially social media for the past like five or six years, where like everything has become like a brand, or like a or has the potential to become a brand like you know very few people comport themselves online now i mean not very few people but the number of people rather who act online as though like every tweet or every post they make is an audition to be a famous comedian or an audition to be like a writer for new york times kind of have, has changed the algorithm for a lot of these places where it's like yeah people feel as though you know every account you have is just a extension of like a brand that you are constructing for yourself 
And so the idea of like every post you make being commodifiable, like where no one can, you know, steal your tweet and put it on their meme Instagram account without like paying you or something, I think does appeal to a lot of people who feel as though they operate in that world. But like, you know, we know it's just going to end up either a being a bubble and having like the rug pulled out from all the, the entire economy by like, you know, a traditional holder of wealth, like a big bank or whatever, when they all just sell out of the Bitcoin at once. Or, you know, it's just not going to result in the level of, I don't know what you call it, economic mobility that it's being promoted as for most people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because even, uh, you know, uh, even people like uh, all of a sudden out of the blue, uh, Jack Dorsey, former CEO of Twitter, is out there speaking out against Web3, which is basically, and he says it too, which was surprising for me to, for me to see. And he's a big Bitcoin guy. So obviously he has his own reasons for uh, being against it. But Web3 is basically the push that all these venture capitalists and big tech people are pushing uh, as the next you know generation of the internet. You know, Web2 was the social web with all the social media stuff, communication, Web3 to them is basically the dis what they call the decentralization of it all. But then you look, at all these Web3 crypto companies that are pushing this whole Web3 thing, they're all backed by the big VC companies who obviously have something to gain from it. That doesn't sound very decentralized to me when they are holding all the various different tokens involved with each, with each of these um, projects that they're backing and they have a monetary gain from you basically buying into it. I mean, it's, it's, you know, we don't, again, another issue where someone is speaking out against this stuff where it's not for the same reason, but you know what, uh, in my opinion, uh, this stuff is, uh, getting bigger. And I think, you know, if, if someone's going to speak out against certain aspects of it, I'll, 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 I'll agree with them and let, you know, and, and spread that message. So maybe that their, uh, you know, their fans and followers or supporters will be like, yeah, that is a bad idea too. Cause this is getting, out of hand at this point now it's going to be like ridiculous when they're trying to make it so like your wallet is inherent your like crypto wallet is inherently tied to everything you do online so like you know how you go to a website and you could like log in via your twitter account or your facebook account and like that's like obviously not good for a privacy perspective that like one company has all your logins or whatever i mean but on another scale imagine it tied to something that is inherently financial like imagine your entire identity is connected and everything you do is logged as your crypto wallet. Like that's so much worse in my opinion. Everything will become commodified and monetizable. And it's just like, you know, if you don't have money and you just want to go online and just take part in something like that might be a, like, obviously you got to pay for internet connection, but beyond that, like imagine everything you do, every site requires you to buy in for something or have some sort of asset. Like it's ridiculous. I mean, that's like kind of the Bill Gatesification too of the internet. He, at his outset, like essentially what Microsoft did too, right? Was that all of like these free programs that people were using, and I'm not up on the text, so like I might be bastardizing what it was, but the 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 uh, amateur- Freeware? Free, yeah, the freeware. I mean, he basically eliminated that too. And so like all this like crypto and NFT stuff is doing, or maybe the NFT stuff more, um, is commodifying, as you say, every inch of the internet. So like even these new frontiers and even these new forms of expression that people are trying to create that are different spaces. No, don't worry. We're going to commodify X, Y, and Z until, I, I mean, until a new space is created from one commodity and then what what's going to happen like i mean there's no uh, the, there's no space that isn't um like part, like for like like for me he, yeah right like for me like here's the most like basic thing if someone asks like isn't the crypto ask you like and they don't know anything about it it's like so simple it's like um, and this will turn people off so fast in my opinion it's it's an issue that i think really describes all of crypto now imagine you send money over you you know you have to buy something and you have to use bitcoin or whatever imagine you send that money and that's it it's done you sent it to the wrong person oh well so sad too bad you send it to someone and they don't give you what you wanted and you want a refund oh well so sad too bad like yeah there's a lot of problems with banking and the financial institutions and we want something better right well, even those terrible institutions take care of you as one of their customers and provide you with refunds, provide you with protection if your money gets stolen. In right. Bitcoin and Ethereum, if we want this to be better, then they should even at least at the very least protect you in cases like that. You know how much money gets sent accidentally or to the wrong person? How many people get scammed every day, especially old people? Now, imagine if all that happened via crypto and there was 
no form of restitution for those people. No, don't worry. Just call your credit card company. They'll take care of it. 99.9% .9 of the time, you're covered. Your money's back in your account the very same moment, and they deal with it on their end. There is not even that in crypto. You send something wrong, you make a single mistake, you type out someone's Bitcoin wallet and you make one digit wrong, like one digit in that string of characters wrong and send it to the wrong person. That's it. Your money's gone. Whether it's five bucks, a thousand bucks, a hundred thousand bucks, millions of bucks gone. Yeah. I think that is the ultimate turnoff for most people in my mind. I just want to, we have a comment. I won't say the name, but, um, just says listening to uh, I love it, Mar, but listening to these guys try to talk about science and technology is legitimately painful. This is not science and technology. <laughs> like bit, crypto is bullshit, and and it, like it's just a scam that uh, for a speculative asset. But let me just say here, this is Brian Eno, um, ambient musician. Uh, you know, um, uh, everyone knows who Brian Eno is. Uh, why don't you dabble in NFTs yourself? This is uh, in an interview with the Crypto Syllabus. Uh, you know, says, I've been approached several times to make an NFT, uh, he says in quotes. So far, nothing has convinced me that there is anything worth making in that arena. Worth making for me implies bringing something into existence that adds value to the world, not just to a bank account. If I'd primarily wanted to make money, I would have had a different career as a different kind of person. I probably wouldn't have chosen to be an artist. NFTs seem to me just a way for artists to get a little piece of the action from global capitalism, our own cute little version of financialization. How sweet. Now, artists can be low capitalist assholes as well and that's the thing like so i when when people like crypto folks say i what don't you want artists to make money yeah i want them to be able to make money without having to be crypto traders uh, what i want is the state to pay for a uh standard of living uh and provide that basically by taxing speculators like you folks and that will pay for the artists to make all the art that they want i don't want them to be able to make trillions of dollars off of a speculative coin that they flip to somebody and then also you know, make yeah. away with the actual dollars that they were always after in the first place right the i mean okay go on the funny thing here about nfts being good for artists is that was like the push for that was like the nft push for a while like oh it's finally struggling artists have a way to make a lot of money and yes there have been some artists who have made money they probably would have made previously but as soon as that came out we are now seeing, and I don't think a lot of people know about this now, there are already workarounds to cut the artists out of NFTs. Mm -hmm. There are now NFT aftermarkets popping up to cut out, because right now the major push for NFTs for artists is that they actually get a cut of the sales every time. So not even just the first time they sell it, every time their artwork is sold on the blockchain after that, they get like a little like a kickback. Uh, so that's like, oh, wow. It's like, uh, you know, you have, uh, money coming in all the time for this one piece that you made that gets sold over and over again. But now there are aftermarkets that look to cut that out. So they don't have to pay that amount to the original artist anymore. And then on top of that, there is now a whole black market where people are just going to the various different, uh, art social networks. What's one of them? Like DeviantArt. They're stealing art from artists and putting it up on the NFT markets as the artists themselves, artists don't even know their art is being uploaded and minted as NFTs. And then they're seeing no money. They contact the NFT markets that are being sold on saying, hey, someone stole that. That's my artwork. And they're not doing anything because they're getting so many cases of this happening that they're just like, we're hands off now. We don't give a shit. So artists are now having their art being stolen and being sold by people who had nothing to do with it and who are making money off of their artwork on top of like everything else I just mentioned. So, I mean, you know, as soon as some, there's some sort of vague benefit of the crypto world, there's already some sort of crypto, uh, you know, marketer or crypto uh, entrepreneur looking to cut that out so they could be the one getting the money. Also, I mean, I, I know, Emily, you want to say something? No, 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 you go first. Um, just, and then we'll, we'll wrap and head into the fun half. No, I'm just going to say also, like I, the claim that like it's anti-science or anti-technology or doesn't understand science or technology if you criticize or don't like crypto or are interested in NFTs, you know, I would lump that in with the same kind of like, but what about the artist thing? It's just like a shallow appeal to like a genre of thing that you're not supposed to like criticize because like, well, if it's art, then it's, you know, something you can't criticize. So like, what about but, the children? Yeah, but like, what if like some person was burning trash and calling it art? Should we just like not criticize it because it's art? And it's like, in reality, it's not about it being technology or science or art. It's about people's ability to make money off of those things. 
because like no one is stopping people from making art no one is stopping people from like doing science or technology we're talking about the negative environmental impacts of those things and how oftentimes they're mis like misattributed to being some kind of like i would say teleological inevitable part of progress when it comes to science technology oh this is just the way like the web is going and so if you're not interested or think it's bad you're just you know a dinosaur and what the art thing is just like come on a lot of these are just like monkey pictures a lot of it is just like derivative <laughs> things because the idea is to like make money in an environment where things are already popular it's like you're making commodities Yep. Emma, do you, I think we should stretch this a little bit. So if you want to make your point, go ahead. No, no, no. I, uh, I feel like it was already covered. Okay. I got one more point. So I saw another comment. Bitcoin is the people's money forged in the 2000. Where are you crash. seeing this? Where, where are you seeing this? Yeah. <laughs> our YouTube chat. Oh. Um, Someone's watching our channel said that about Bitcoin. What's going on here? Let's just address that for a moment. That's First funny. of all, who controls Bitcoin? Like, I'm sorry, like people do not control Bitcoin. It's all in any crypto, right? This idea that the, the, the people who are invested in it should be the only people in control of the currency yeah. that you want to like take over society is dangerous. And in my opinion, like almost like fascist, like the government should have control over money. The 2008 crash, the problem wasn't that we printed money. The problem was that we printed money and gave it to bankers. Mm -hmm. We should have given it to homeowners and folks that needed relief in other ways, right? Like, so it's good to print money. That's, that's the secret thing about all this crypto stuff is it's 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 uh basically new age gold bug uh anti print money uh anti-inflation stuff and they they have speculative assets and they don't want they want those to continue well they say it's up. democratizing wall street journal came out with an article uh a few days ago where they calculated that the top 0.01 percent owned 27 percent of crypto and yes. like it's yes. top heavy in another figure that i can't think of off the top of my head how too. could it ever be democratic when in order to get the stuff you need a capital investments like like computers to mine it that are insanely like it's a and that's who control that's who controls bitcoin by the way it's not yeah. even like like yeah it is the like yeah there is enormous inequality in bitcoin like you said 20 uh 0.01 percent of buyers control around 27 percent of the total supply which amounts to around 5 million bitcoins which in turn comes out to about 232 billion usd that's from uh the uh national bureau of economic research study um, and then on top of that, you have the miners who are actually the ones who are spending all the money and burning up all that energy consumption uh, and ruining the environment uh, to basically uh, solve these equations to create more Bitcoin. And they're the ones who basically have the say over the protocols that like judge what rules and regulations happen to Bitcoin. Like there is a 21 million Bitcoin finite supply. Once that's all mined up, that's it. Unless, of course, all the miners get together and vote to decide to, now we'll create some more Bitcoin. So, and I mean... They, yeah, and they have that position of that of authority over your utopia currency because they wasted energy for nothing but speculation. So, f go fuck yourselves. <laughs> right. I mean, it's sad to me because it is mostly people who just are, like, you hear it, and it's always like, oh, my family was hurt, but... Other than obviously the rich VCs, I'm talking about the dupes who are believing this stuff. I'm assuming the type of people who, who would be in our chat. Uh, <laughs> but um, you it's know, they, they, but the they, same they, mentality from the people who get suckered into MLMs. Yep. It's yeah. Like a, yeah they, that's what I out. tweeted the other day. I said it was like Lula Lula Row for dude bros. That's a, what this is. It's like a deep fear of missing out amongst the population. Yeah. Instead of like moms who are like single moms, it's just like people who have a like a certain level of tech literacy as a result of being like you know either raised in a technological world or having like a vaguely tech related job, like deciding that this is their path to you know becoming rich in a world that they've been largely probably you know boxed out of traditional methods like you know it people or like people who like fix their grandmother's computer when she downloads viruses or something you know like this is their this is their uh mlm this is their version of that because it appeals to that those same kinds of like well you're just a little smarter than the rest of the people who can't get this Yep. I would love to replace the financial institutions and the big banks. I'd love to see them crumble. I'd love it. But the point is we want to replace – we would replace that world with something better. Like the thing to me is like they always talk about like the unbanked. Like, you know, crypto will finally – you don't need to open up a bank account with crypto and have minimums and this and that. And, you know, the big banks will take advantage of you with loans while there are crypto things doing all this, taking advantage of people like DeFi, tons of stuff that are taking advantage of people. But, you know – 
uh, why not look into like, why not like become an advocate for like postal banking or something that wow. would actually help people and actually wow. give people like, you know, like it's that simple. Like, and if you want to like eliminate the entire banking system and financial world, let's talk about what would make it better, like a better replacement, a better world. Like crypto is an alternative, but it doesn't mean it's better. In fact, in many ways it's worse. Yeah, I mean, it couldn't be a majority report show, and it's very fitting that this is the final show of the day without postal banking coming up. I mean, that is that is that was a wonderful cherry on top there, Matt. I mean, that Thank you. really is because that is what the type of policy that would help, say, for people, yes. unbanked people in El Salvador, um, for even right, like create a postal system that banks people like that. But tying and in it the to United the speculation, States. of course. Well, in the I mean, States, yeah, yeah, that, that that would right, um, that would actually be, and then it would undercut. Uh, loan sharks and you know predatory lending and all that kind of stuff i i don't feel very strongly about crypto i don't feel like you know angry about its existence it just feels very much like the kind of thing that people would come to your door knocking about 10 mm -hmm. years ago if it were a different kind of product and you'd have to be like politely be like no yeah because it's not steak knives but in you know in reality at least you could use steak knives yeah it feels like a scam for people who know that capitalism is a scam and know that generally like work is a scam and all the things that we talk about generally from like a leftist perspective are scams but they want to like be part of that scam and they think this is just the new frontier of capitalism scams yeah and so like, that's not really a place that i want to go so much as a place where like oh no no i don't care about decentralizing the like the web or wealth system or whatever the hell they're talking about because i don't think that's going to lead to like the kind of equality they say it is it's because mostly it's just about like individuals in that world getting rich who are not traditionally rich individuals you know in their mind which doesn't like even if we concede that it'll make someone who like 10 people uh, 10 percent of people who engage in crypto uh, even the like, highest number imaginable richer than they were before that's still not like the part the you know the purpose of leftism generally in my opinion yes. yeah another, to have another new type of billionaire out there to make a whole bunch of money for having done the, no yeah. work boom and with that said somebody asked if we could get this nft discussion clipped i'm sure we will um to show people if they are thinking about getting involved in the crypto scam i mean and look like if you have money don't don't just don't put any more money than you yes. would take to a casino like i think you can make uh gains in speculation uh, i just don't think that's what we should uh uh, uh point society towards if you want to bet on the jacksonville jaguars bet on the jacksonville right. jaguars i'm not going to stop you just don't bet all your money on it um with that said we are going to head into the fun half now um six four six two five seven three nine twenty and there, I can handle the phones here, so it'll be easier because our connection's probably a little bit, you know, more stable or whatever. So sure. uh, we will do the phones and we'll be taking your calls. We'll be reading your IMs. We'll be doing more clips, more clips. Um, and they'll do be sticking around. Final plugs. Oh, yes. Uh, and of course, Left Reckoning happened last night. The final Left Reckoning. Uh, yeah, just go check that out, folks. We did the uh, uh, bum steer of the year, which was a Pramila Jaro poll. Um, mm, okay. uh, and uh, just, you know, making sure we um, learn the right lessons from what approaches and theories of change work. And when they are tested, you know, making sure that we notice the results of that test. And uh, in my opinion, it looks like uh, the um, junior partners in democracy uh, where the where the progressives and Joe Biden are partners, like that failed as far as I'm concerned. So yeah. I think it's important to note that. Um, so patreon.com slash left reckoning. We'll, we'll probably do some uh, impromptu streams next week too. And that doomed. What's happening over there? Yeah, so uh, I did the uh, show for this week on Tuesday. We had a lot of great clips, uh, including uh, one we'll get to at the end of, uh, in the fun half of this show, the uh, that fantastic Trump uh, Christmas uh, uh, segment. But uh, youtube.com slash Matt Binder. Twitch.tv slash Matt Bender. You could find the show from Tuesday on there. Also for the audio version, doomedcast.com. Uh, also, being that we've had this whole crypto discussion, I have a crypto show, an entire show, new show separate from Doomed coming out in the new year. Stay Whoa. tuned. All the information on that will be coming out in the upcoming week or two, actually. We're getting close. Uh, it's going to be great. You're, you're, I think you'll all enjoy it a lot. Uh, so stick, uh, stay tuned for that. Follow me on Twitter at Matt Binder, and uh, that's how you can keep updated on it. Very exciting. The I, discourse. I don't have anything new on the discourse to promote because all of my co-hosts are on vacation. But you can still check out episodes on the Patreon or SoundCloud, and you know we'll probably put up some old archive footage that's been taken down due to the many copyright violations that exist <laughs> in them. Uh, but yeah. 
I noticed you're dressed very festive today. You have a red shirt underneath a green, oh, wow. and then underneath a green. Look at oh, that. Yeah, it, yeah. Was that purposeful? Well, no. I was going to wear the red shirt, but it's a little too tight. It actually has words on it that you can't see. It says Dragon Sound, which is the band from Miami Connection. Oh. Well, one of the greatest movies ever made. <laughs> you are. The Taekwondo uh, uh, rock band. <laughs> Man, six four six two five seven three nine twenty. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks, six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? Alpha males are back. Back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes has what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a whoa! Well, what a fucking nightmare! What a fucking nightmare! nightmare. Bring back DJ Danner. Danner. Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. You see, white people doing drugs, they look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflake says what? 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 matter <laughs> have you tried doing an impression on a college campus I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this psych and the alpha males are back 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 and the africans are black 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 african and the alpha males are black 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 and the africans are back 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 Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck em. Fuck em. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are black. to pay the price of blast to be around here. I, 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 I am a total... I'm still eating. Now, hello, everybody. We were just talking about the soda I was drinking, uh, Inca Cola, the Peruvian soda. Uh, in case anyone was wondering, because Matt Leck thought I was uh, drinking. That, that was very promotional sounding, wasn't it? But that was because Matt Leck uh, accused me of drinking beer. And as everyone knows, I am straight edge. Don't drink alcohol. Oh. So I needed to I needed to uh, knock that piece of misinformation, that disinfo down. Some of us are not straight edge. Is that true? You're straight edge? Yeah, I've been straight edge for a very long time. Yes. I, 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 my last sip of alcohol was in high school. I feel like I knew. <laughs> I used to say I, I watched a lot of Majority Report when I was in college in grad school. So you might have said that on air before, and I just like forgot. Oh, you did? Yeah, I watched a lot of uh, Majority Report when I was like in my sophomore and like seen like a sophomore year of college through like grad school when I was like writing and shit. Wow. Yeah, you know. I'm How's a, it feel to be in the you know I mean in the universe now? I am actually honored. You know, frankly, I'm not a man with big dreams. I just dream of being incredibly strong and mildly famous. And so this is the, <laughs> um, 
This is like the most improbable set of circumstances that, you know, I could have possibly been in. What do you think That's of... a good book name for you, for your, your biography. Incredibly strong and mildly famous. Yeah. yeah. You, I mean, what do you think of this uh, blue point, Matt? Oh uh, yeah, we, Emma just uh, we're, Emma and I are drinking. Um, yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we already discussed not this. Not straight edge like Binder um, and Brandon didn't. And Bradley's remote uh, this week. And edge. Bradley, I mean, I I don't. Are you gonna join us? Yeah, let me spike my coffee. Oh whoa! <laughs> <laughs> drinking just makes me sleepy. I'm I'm a very low energy person. Don't tell Trump; he might get upset. But <laughs> if I... If I get too low energy, shwasted, Brandon. If I get too shwasted before like five p.m., I'm just gonna be in bed by like ten and feel bad. Man, it's been a very Trumpy day. Maybe we should get to that Christmas thing now. But um, yeah. the Trump never drinking thing was always an interesting angle. So weird. Him. Yeah. So weird, and the germaphobe thing is interesting too. Um, yeah. That he doesn't. But I thought he. I, People used to say he didn't shake hands, but like when he was president, he would shake hands all the time. Dude, he's the type of germaphobe who goes to McDonald's because <laughs> he's that's that's where he can be sure that he's not going to be poisoned. Wasn't that the story? He's the kind of germaphobe who's like classist and who just thinks poor people and people who have less money than him are dirty. And so he doesn't like, you know, come, right. uh, mingling with them. Maybe that is the secret to the art of the deal that he's never let us in on. Maybe the reason he's been so successful is he gets meetings with like uh, big money people he gets them really drunk and he doesn't drink and then they agree to whatever he asks for. I mean, I could imagine if you're drunk around Trump, I, you would be laughing a lot. That guy's funny. I think um, Binder's, that strategy was used, I think, by some prominent politician. LBJ comes to mind, but I think that's because there's a lot of telltales about LBJ. But yeah, it's I, I'm pretty sure it was. He would have his assistant pour drinks and he would have his um diluted like mm. half as much and they drink over the course of the night uh, of the evening and all of a sudden yeah it's you get people over a barrel that's a technique a used in that's a technique used in mad men roger sterling advises lane price to use that technique water down your drink and get your get your clients drunk it's also a technique used by the spies in uh the americans the russian spies um so i mean go uh, go Less verification through the uh, television yeah i mean they also did this thing where i like when they're trying to, you know, get information, they would take shots of olive oil to coat their stomach so they could look like they were drinking with people and they would get less drunk, which I didn't know if that was that's a true thing that works. But Interesting. Um, speaking of LBJ, we have an IMer named Glem right in uh, to ask you a question, Matt. Okay. I'm generally sympathetic to the idea that the CIA killed JFK, which we covered yesterday, yep. uh, you guys. But if so, why didn't we invade Cuba under LBJ? Sorry for the acronym salad. My my um, guess is that it, Bay of Pigs went so badly that maybe they were like scared. The assassination and the setup of Oswald went too badly that um, mm. that I think um, I think LBJ actually held off uh, or like it was too obvious and realized we can't do this because there's this um, radio interview with Oswald and New Orleans um, radio. Uh, like a, a year or so before the assassination where he's um, doing fair play for Cuba stuff. Leave your hands off Cuba, let Cuba alone. Um, making ba Basically setting his bona fides for being a, uh, anth or ba being a communist, a pro-Cuba communist in the media. Um, and, uh, and I think it was just too obvious. And, and like, like we said, Jackie Kennedy said, we don't buy any of that stuff. We think it was his domestic enemies. Mm. Um, uh, and I think it was just... I, I and I think the reason and Morley says and people can check out Morley did 45 minutes on C-SPAN a couple uh, three or four days ago and he was asked about LBJ's role and a lot of people do suspect LBJ. I am suspicious of that entire line because I think it's like a, a, a I think it's a um it, it leaves people up a, of at least it leaves people off the trail. Um, I also, think Morley, were they just satisfied with Vietnam? Like cool, like you know, that, like that's the consolation prize I yeah. think. And like and I think uh, but Morley thinks. Like the way you look at how the Warren Commission stuff was coordinated immediately after, and uh, I think Morley's take on LBJ is um, better than I can give you right now. Got it. Um, Mopping Up says, we need to start naming the Higher Education Act specifically as the tool Biden can and has used to cancel federal student debt without the need for Congress or Mansion. Um, yeah. Uh, also, I uh, let me know if you see any efforts organized around particularly May Day. Uh, and the new uh, pushback date for student loan debt because uh, I've seen some people suggest that it's an opportune time to, uh, to have another Jubilee uh, sort of uh, demonstration, stuff like that. So I'd like to see what efforts are being done there. Jeff from Atlanta says, Emma has absolutely crushed it this week. Thanks for the great shows and happy holidays. Thank you so much. 
uh, crypto scammer writes in crypto is super good life saving penis enlarging panty dropping acne curing weight loss tech. <laughs> um, That's why I've just launched my new NFT project, uh, Buff Coin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, honestly, honestly, you you put it together and put your face out there, which is something that like majority of these projects don't have a face to attach it with, and you would probably have a successful little scam there going, uh, Brandon, if you wanted no, I, to. I would want a rug pull. I'm not, I'm not interested in like having my face attached at all. I don't think. Uh, I need, yeah, I think that might be. That, that's the problem. Yeah, no. I mean, honestly, you just got to put together like a white paper and like keep the uh, keep the typos to under like ten. Yeah. And right. You know, it's funny because like it, it does actually make sense. Like the the um, format, like NFTs for if you get get rid of the, um, the unnecessariness of triple accounting and you know proof of work and all the wasteful energy stuff. When NFTs came out about basketball cards and basically like a limited run number of these basketball cards, that is interesting to me. And I think it like memorabilia. I can see why that. Um, makes sense, but you just don't need the Bitcoin crypto angle of it, right? You just have this be a limited run of something, and uh, that'd be it. There's, there's no need for it to like burn down the Amazon, right? But there, then there goes the whole the whole marketing ploy because no one would really care about that. Like the people who are buying into this stuff have ulterior motives, for the most part, and that is to promote the idea that crypto is the future. That's right. why, like that that constitution crowdfunding project that you could have like started on GoFundMe or Kickstarter or Indiegogo where you just raised right. money from people to buy the constitution. That's why I wouldn't have worked on any of those platforms because the reason they made all that uh, uh, crowdfunding success via crypto was because big money crypto people wanted to promote crypto use with it. Dr. Gus from Florida says, I for one endorse the science and technology discussions had in majority report. I've been really impressed with your COVID coverage. Also looking forward to Matt's crypto show. So there you go. You already oh, got thank you. you. You got some fans already. Um, yeah. Sarah Toomey says, can uh, new Matt define fascist? He uses this term almost every day and I'm convinced he doesn't know what fascism is. Jesus, I'm sorry. I read that I am before. No, that's fine. I, I mean, saw the rest. <laughs> I, I think fascism is basically enforcing a hierarchical society with force. Um, and I think it's, I, I think there, I, I'm open to lots of different definitions from like the Communist Party, uh, the Communist International definitions or Robert Paxton. Uh, there's not a uh, one uh, transcendent definition of fascist, but uh, uh, if he would like to challenge my use of fascist in any given yes, right uh, in with time, your definition. Well, no, I would like to say if my if he thinks any of my uses of it were uh, uh, out of line, then um, let let's talk about those specific instances. Or also give you your definition because apparently, if you know the one transcendent definition, uh, let's hear it. A lot of things in America are fascist. You know, we just of course. Have, we just it's have just to... forcible suppression of largely leftist opposition, usually by violence and uh, often for the sake of capital. Not I, that hard. I, I, mainly, I think, I, I think capital plus violence. Yeah. I, I'll always love that the uh, the conservative like a uh, retort to that. It's like, oh, everything you don't like is fascism. Well, I actually like a lot of things. And one of the very few things I don't like is fascism. So, yeah, for the most part, everything I don't like is pretty much fascism. Um, Skippy says, happy, happy holidays, MR crew. Thank you. Auda Statamania says, there's stories about judges not allowing separated parents to see their kid unless they get vaccinated first. My cousin is one of these people. He's on Facebook spreading lies that his vax status is why he can't see his kid. When in reality, it's because the mother of his kid has full custody because he was arrested for domestic abuse. And it's her wishes that the judge is upholding. He's not telling people about that, though. SMH. Yeah, I mean... Everything's the vax mandate. Mansion fucks dogs. Please change oh, your that, 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 that He keeps that. writing in this, or she keeps writing in with this handle, and it's hard to read every time. I like that the previous I am. That's, I just don't want to move on from the previous I am. That previous I am uh, reminded me, actually, of, have you guys heard about Madison Cawthorn's uh, statement last night? Oh, yes. he, he and his wife are getting divorced due to their irrecognizable <laughs> differences. After eight months? After, <laughs> after eight months. <laughs> no, he's too popular as a politician, I heard, is what caused it. I don't even like I, the giving this guy. Uh, the, there is a weird, like, obsession with Madison Cawthorn that I don't even want to give him attention. He's just so desperately seeking it. It's ridiculous. It's, yeah. this, it's this new wave of, like, post AOC, like, right wing yeah. politicians who are, like, really there just to promote their, like, Instagram account and this kind of weird, like, new, um, uh, like economy of like stupid far right demagogues, like you know every day, every week we have a new like four Republican House members. So, like, is this the Republicans' new squad? These uh, housewives from uh, all over the Midwest, and it's like who? Like, no. And then next week it's a di four different. We have a lot of uh, Congress people, is what I'm trying to say, right. who are just out there. 
Do you think uh, that she liked when she? Do you think that she liked when he called her an earthly vessel of God or something like that? That's not. That's all. That's all women are earthly that's vessels. All, that's God. how I refer to myself. I wake up in the morning and as I brush my teeth, I say, "Good job being God's most, you know, average earthly vessel possible." I think it's a little sexist, misogynist, even to imply that men are not also God's earthly vessels. Well, that's misandry. That's misandry. Excuse you. It's, yes. It's reverse sexism, whatever you call, want to call it. Calling from an 818 number, I believe I know who this is. Who is this? Where are you calling from? Hey, it's Dave from Jamaica. How are you guys doing? What's up, and, Dave? Um, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Dave. Happy holidays. You called yesterday, and I was going to pick up your call, and then you hung up. No, no, it's not that. You said no more calls, and you went. Oh, uh, well. And then it cut out. <laughs> uh, I just... But mixed messages. Though. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to believe here, Dave. <laughs> but but um jokes aside um i guess so i'll try to make it fun since it's like the last show of the year um i was thinking like if you could go back in time what inventions would you prevent from being invented like personally i'm against the personal automobile mm. because I, I, I see a lot of things changing if that wasn't invented like see how cities are built and you know suburbs would be banned as trump fairs well, what you guys? Think? This is a great question. I, I gotta give it some thought, though. Give me yeah, second. I was. My first thought was, uh, like the discovery of fossil fuels. But I mean, that might be a little expansive. Yeah, I mean, whales would be totally extinct if we didn't figure that out, um, because we were really on whale oil before then. Um, uh, but you know, I don't know that. The... And coal too, so it would still be pretty Co dirty. The automobile is a good one, but it's even it's tough even then because like. No, I, I agree with you on the automobile. I have a mixed relationship with that because the um, progressive reforms, uh, the agrarian agrarian reforms of North Dakota populists, uh, the uh, um, the nonpartisan league, which uh, um, North Dakota had open ballots in the 20s, so they ran on both parties, and they uh, basically took over um, the Democratic Party and made a state grain elevator in St. Bake, but they organized by the Model T and by driving it around North Dakota um, like that. Um, but I'll, but what you're saying about um, the the way it just defaced cities in a way that is just disgusting, um, I and and also unsustainable from a, a, a energy standpoint. I think you're right about cars. Uh, nuclear weapons is yeah. now. I just thought about that. Yeah, that's another good one. Yeah, <laughs> that's um, probably it. I guess. I guess because I'm a bit of a science fan. Oh, sorry. You, I think Matt, the, um, Matt Binder was going. No, no, you go ahead. I didn't say anything. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I guess for me, I guess since I'm a little bit of a science nerd, certain things like I can see kind of unavoidable. Like I just said, if you have nuclear energy, you're going to get nuclear weapons. It's kind of a flip side of the coin, right? Because um, some asshole is going to use it for something bad. I mean, we basically got the bad. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess we do have some nuclear energy now, but um, the main uh, impact of nuclear weapons, to me, it seems to be... Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the mass murder of Japanese well, people? Like <laughs> that, and yeah. that immediate result, and then the uh, sort of like Cold War, uh, sort of, I mean, the American hegemony of the world. Yeah. Because look at what we did. Right. And don't, you don't want this to happen to you. Mm -hmm. Um. Also, um, when you guys were talking about crypto and um, Trump's um, being very pro-vax because, you know, he, he sees it as a personal link, aggrandizement vehicle, um, I think knowing how Trump worked with the conservatives is why they like him because he can read a room very well mm -hmm. and he tells them what they want to hear and then stuff that they don't really feel strongly on, he can kind of command them on. I think this is like the one weakness you would see if he keeps hammering it, right? If he keeps on saying the vaccines are good, vaccines are good. I think that might be the only thing the conservative base would um, turn on him on if he keeps doing it. Constantly. I think they'll ignore him like, 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 like the, at, I think they would, it, I think they would ignore him like the evangelicals ignored his like multiple infidelities, porn stars. I mean, they, they're they so mag, they, I think they're so um, attracted to his magnetic personality and like the the triggering the libs thing is the number one uh, de uh, defining characteristic of like what a Republican primary voter wants right now and he's number one by a mile in that yeah and I think that's kind of an interesting point too Emma because like ultimately 
like this dynamic of like wanting to trigger the libs is what they're hoping by having trump on the show but trump has you know in many ways triggered the libs too hard and he's been banned from social media for that and they're not trying to get that to happen to them because this is still their bread and butter and so there is that also that kind of weird gap between the two when it comes to like okay well the republicans are looking in a lot of right-wing uh demagogues and content creators looking for a post-trump vehicle like after trump is no longer on social media they can't like you no, no offense, Dick ride them there uh, for the rest of like you know the like the rest for like content. They have to find a Trump replacement that is just as animating, that is just as kind of like victimizing as they can as Trump was, you know. And in many ways, like the anti-vaxxer stuff has become like the you know post-Trump being banned in the aftermath of Jan Six. It's like it's just a new way to unite uh, the right around uh, you know anti-lib cause. Yeah. Mm. I, I actually I actually brought this up on my show on Tuesday where I think each subgenre of Trump supporter has their own fictionalized version of Trump in their head who they view as their hero, their yeah. lion, their North Star, their God. The QAnon people have their own version of Trump. The evangelicals have their own version of Trump. There's overlap between a lot of them, but they each have their own version of fictionalized Trump. And that's when you hear like, you know, when he got booed for taking the booster at the Bill O'Reilly uh, tour, you know, in their head, they're probably thinking something like, boo, what Trump just said. Trump, a.k.a. the version in their head, would never agree to that because he's taken so many positions, they just pick and choose which one they want to internalize as their version of Trump. And at the end of the day, when it comes time to vote, they're really voting for that fictionalized version of Trump in their head. So that's how he'll continue to get them to vote for him. I'll, I'll get, this will be the last thing I'll jump off since I know other people want to get on. Um, uh, before, when I was young, I used to critique... Uh, I used to not like reality TV, but then I realized I have my own version of it. And then I started watching this thing that's no longer on air. It was by um, Ice Cube, the black and white thing oh, where they put oh, white oh. people in blackface. Oh, man, you uh, called in the right day. Yeah, that, that is peak. I, I love that show. 2005 <laughs> FX's black, black, white, Ice Cube. That's I have that on DVD. I had to buy it because the quality online just wasn't high enough for my taste. And they've, Ice T has, I mean, Ice Cube has buried that one, man. No, but it's so good. <laughs> they want an Emmy. They want an Emmy for makeup on that one. 2005 was a different time. That was the height of of social justice television. What's it called? It's called Black Period, White Period. Uh, the cover of it is like, uh, you know black and white i guess not silhouette but like just two families in like a black and white background and one of them is black and one of them is white but they race swapped them kind of this is like the round time of like wife swap shows and like you know trading spouses this like, is what sarah silverman got in trouble for for doing on the sarah silverman program yeah but this was promoted as like a social experiment like this was like right, ice right. cube social experiment to teach oh, like a white God. family that they were actually like you know the of people that like racism was real and that like you know let white people experience what it's like to be a different race i think the show ended spontaneously because you no know, spoiler alert the white mom either in or out of blackface called like a group of like black slam poets like animals or something like, great not like she didn't mean it um uh like racistly she said like yeah. you know like she said something and i don't want to be misquoted people get mad when i misremember quote misremember things that happened in like shows from a, a decade ago <laughs> but like they were like doing slam poetry at like the sort of group race house that they had the black and white family because they were like slowly were living together too and like they were doing slam poetry to, and like the white mom was just like you know you guys are such beautiful artists your bestial spirit like really comes through when you like you know do poetry and then like everyone's like <laughs> okay and then they just like left which I mean, I think it won an, I think it won an Emmy. Yeah, for makeup. For like, yeah, but and I think the white mom and dad they got divorced because I think what is his name? Yeah, Bruno. He was so racist. Bruno <laughs> says Bruno says the N word the first day, like before he's even in the makeup. Yeah. He didn't even wait. He didn't even wait till like the brown face dry to drop like the N bomb. He was like he was dying for. It. He's like I can't wait to see what it's like to be a bleep. <laughs> You know, and like the black family was just like, okay, that's not right. Let's try again. <laughs> uh, 
it, it, trust me, uh, Emma, you should watch it. I, I, I will. Like brain rot. Watch yeah. it. It's peak brain rot. It's but when you say <laughs> slam poetry, I'm all I'm already cringing. Uh, but at the same time, I'm I'm morbidly curious. You can learn a lot from reality I, television back in the old days because that was before everyone so who went pure. on reality television went on trying to be famous. That was, I mean, well, they went on trying to be famous, but they didn't have social media fame back then. They went on trying to be a different kind of famous. No, I want like an anthropological study of like the uh, nationalism and but like and uh purity of early american idol so like, and manipulative like, tactics I, that's what i want I, I think the i think the white girl in it she did, she was okay she as because younger people are but the mom was just so weird but bruno i think bruno stole the show <laughs> he's like it's like Four channer, he had the four chan mentality before four chan. Mm. They barely needed the the black family there. That could have been a whole different show. And to be friend, to be frank, because like it, it was just a big sharp divide between what the two families were doing and dealing, which obviously, but like you know, I would have watched just the old, like the white family go through it. Was the makeup actually good? No. No. Not, not, not by today's standards. Funny enough, the like black to white makeup, I think worked a little bit better than the like white to black makeup. But I, you know, I think that's just because like oftentimes people have to lighten their skin from movies and like makeup to do that stuff where you don't often find yourself, you know, how many makeup artists specialize in blackface besides, uh, you know, Justin Trudeau. <laughs> I should, I should. All right, Dave, I'm, we gotta All let you right, go, guys, but. Uh, yeah. I appreciate it. it. Have a have a happy new year, Dave. My favorite reality television show, speaking yeah. of TV show Nationalism, sorry Dave for talking over your goodbye. That was rude of me. But like if you watch early uh Amazing Race, I might have talked about this before, they go to Vietnam a lot. And like you really get the sense of how Americans like how like Americans don't know anything about Vietnam because they'll just like walk past like statues that are called like monument to against against oppression in and, like in imperialism yeah. and they'll just go like hmm what a great monument we love freedom in America too <laughs> <laughs> like we they also go to like John McCain's like POW like sell a lot in that one. <laughs> I've been to Vietnam and I went to the that that was uh that was an interesting my my, uh, my stepsister was living there for a while and I went to the uh museum that they had on the war different different framing different framing than what we get in the United States for sure should do more of that yeah critical Vietnam theory um Bradley you're right we should do this I mean this is such a heavy Trump show but uh, yes well the, I have those two clips in mind as well I'm the reason for the season okay this time last year Trump, oh, I love this clip so much COVID right at the end of the year that was that was a pure moment of bliss yeah well to break up the Trump stuff we can we can sprinkle in some Elon Musk and then we can do you want is that okay if we, uh, Trump I think now? we should I think, I think we should do the Trump Christmas first point. yeah that's third look I'm, I'm i'm half a beer in i need my trump okay <laughs> okay oh damn I, i'm i'm, I'm telling you i'm gonna i'm gonna build this clip up because it's worth it this is easily okay. one of the Sorry. top clips of the year it is so good matt how about you explain it matt is the okay. only who should explain it <laughs> all right so uh i don't know if you guys knew this but apparently mike huckabee is still uh still going strong over on newsmax with the show and uh, he had on Donald Trump to talk about what else but the Christmas season. Now, get ready for this. I want you to, going into this, I want you guys to pay attention to a few things. Of course, what Trump is saying, but also please take a look at how Mike, B, how Mike Huckabee, excuse me, looks today. Mike B. Mike B. And uh, also, please, please, please notice the background holiday music Thank playing you. throughout this whole segment. It is just like the, the entire thing, every little element, it's just, it's 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 a cinematic masterpiece, quite frankly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you didn't say that, that's what I was gonna bring up. The music just makes this. It's like like the '90s. Like was it Elf? Danny Elfman was he the music guide for all those movies? Uh, for he who? was uh, Tim Burton's music guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that. Oh, I mean, know, like, um, this is like obviously not. Christmas. It's not in that style, but like with that level of I think inspiredness. Uh, I mean, there's also there's also toward. There's also towards the end, like imagine like if the uh, the uh, the band sinking with the Titanic all of a sudden started to play a Christmas song. Very <laughs> weird music at the end, but let's play it. <laughs> America had gone through a long period where people quit saying Merry Christmas. It was all happy holidays. You deliberately changed that. All right, can you pause and it? And openly <laughs> said it's A lot, lot to yeah. talk about already, yes. 
Uh, my, uh, is Mike Huckabee trying to transform into Santa before it's our very Santa eyes? Huckabee. And it's, uh, I, like, like Ted Cruz and like Glenn Beck, it looks better but, than okay, his I, face. But I mean, it, like, he, then he's got to ditch the hair dye altogether. <laughs> uh, on my show, I said he was uh, cosplaying as Scott Calvin in the hit Tim Allen film, The Santa Claus. Do you remember when he wakes <laughs> right. up, looks in the mirror? That's exactly Just how he looks. Like day, day three of the transformation. Dude, this is not what I picture Mike Huckabee looking like. I was like, "What?" Yeah. All right. He's got a he's got a a, a, a Santa Claus esque beard growing in. Better, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Christmas, we're gonna say it again. In fact, it was that part of my campaign, Mike. You yeah. know, the country had started with this woke, I guess, uh, a little bit before that. Yeah. And it was embarrassing for stores to say Merry Christmas. You'd see these big chains, they want your money, but they don't want to say Merry Christmas. And they'd use reds and they'd use whites and snow, but they wouldn't say Christmas. And when I started campaigning, this was in 2015, when I started campaigning, I said, you're gonna say Merry Christmas again. And now people are saying it. Of course, they're not saying a lot of other things like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> you know, those names are being obliterated pause it, pause it, because pause of it. craziness. Now, in the context of this, it really does sound like Donald Trump is recalling a time where people were like, Merry Christmas, and people would apply, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington. <laughs> like, it's just so bizarre, so bizarre, this whole conversation. Well, first of all, I, I don't recall a time where people didn't say Merry Christmas. Just to be just to be clear, in case you're watching, going, wow, did Trump really bring back Christmas? Uh, people have been saying Merry Christmas forever. That's never, it's just like, come on, come on. <laughs> People stopped saying Merry Christmas when we had a black president and they started saying Happy Kwanzaa. <laughs> uh, obviously, Matt. I like how embarrassed Macy's was that like around Christmas time. It's like, oh, this is very uncomfortable. You couldn't even put like, remember, you couldn't put like Happy or Merry Christmas blank person's name on their Starbucks cup for like, you know, 2009 to 2016. They would just put like Kuchigagulia or whatever the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, Hanukkah, I mean, not Hanukkah, the uh, Kwanzaa things are, and that would just be it. And you'd have to be like, what? That's not my name. Yeah. Merry Christmas and a happy Teddy Roosevelt. To <laughs> <laughs> well, please continue. Please continue. But uh, they are saying Merry Christmas again. We got that. That was a big part of what I was doing. And so I would say it all the time during that period that we want them to say Merry Christmas. Don't shop at stores that don't say Merry Christmas. And I'll tell you, we brought it back very quickly. You really did. And I think a lot of people <laughs> appreciated that it was a part of the American culture. It was a part of who we are. It wasn't uh, to exclude anybody. It was just simply a celebration of what America does at Christmas. And America and the world, but America loves Christmas. Yeah. And whether you're Muslim, whether you're Christian, whether you're Jewish, everyone loves Christmas. And they'd say Merry Christmas until these crazy people came along and they wanted to stop it along with everything else. So I was very proud of that actually. Remember I used to say, we will say Merry Christmas again in front of these massive crowds of people. Wait, are you, hold on, pause it. We need to play the last. Are they? Is it Oh Danny Boy that's playing in the background? Yeah, it sounded kind of like you know, a way a little bit more like uh, folk than normal Christmas music. Where'd they get the B-roll? Is it out of a Hallmark Christmas uh, special? Did Newsmax specifically shoot it? I need to know because there was. A, I mean, there was an ornament that said "Be Best," right? That was. Uh, yeah, it was. Yes. <laughs> Melania's slogan. That was Melania's uh, whole deal. Can you do play the uh, the final like fifteen seconds? Honestly, no. Take it back like fifteen more seconds, and let's okay. enjoy more of this video. <laughs> it's so good. Quickly, you really did, and I think a lot of people appreciated that it was a part of the American culture. It was a part of who we are. It wasn't uh, to exclude anybody. It was just simply a celebration of what America does at Christmas. And America and the world, but America loves Christmas. Yeah. And whether you're Muslim, whether you're Christian, whether you're Jewish, everyone loves Christmas. And they'd say Merry Christmas until these crazy people came along and they wanted to stop it along with everything else. So I was very proud of that, actually. Remember, I used to say, we will say Merry Christmas again in front of these massive crowds of people. Oh God, who would decorate their home that much? It looks like they're like filming Home Alone 7 in there. Like, it's just like such a waste of money and time to decorate that, to have like that many throw pillows for one month of the year. Yeah.
well, throw pillows are synonymous with like that kind of like white family. You got to have as many throw pillows as possible. You know, that what? is something I noticed too. All the, I mean, it should be obvious, but all the stock footage they made sure that the families were very, very white. By the way, every single oh, one of those families. Yes. Yeah. This is about what a uh, Christmas means to America, aka like this is just another of the many fronts in the right wing's our grievement argument that like American values are under attack by you know any number of named and unnamed sources, the deep state, the uh, Muslims, the Jewish people who don't enjoy <laughs> Christmas, I suppose, even though they should. Um, well, according to Trump, the Muslim people and Jewish people love Christmas now. Ever since he brought back Merry Christmas, Muslims and Jews celebrate Christmas apparently. If you watch a lot of Hallmark Christmas movies, the ones about Hanukkah are actually also about Christmas somehow. You know, like this, what it reminds me of like when he said, when um, the, like this is his lasting legacy that he wants to emphasize, right? Not like, oh, I put a whole bunch of people who primarily learn about the world through Breitbart magazine on the judiciary. Like that's, <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, it also reminds me of like Joe Biden before, like the, what, what these folks are looking at for like uh, uh, signs of that they did a good job, which is also like Biden saying like, look, we have interracial families represented in commercials. And it's like, bro, like we need something beyond like being able to say Merry Christmas again or being able to see like a world we want to see in commercials. Um, well, it uh, makes them like, I mean, it, it it oddly humanizes people like Biden and Trump in that way because it's just like, oh, you're a yeah, child. Exactly, yes. You're a fucking child. This is what you're interested in. And, and like, I mean, Huckabee too, right? Like you guys just want to be told nice bedtime stories and have uh, the have the the stores that you like not just be in red and white, but also say Christmas on them. It was They'd, embarrassing for them to say Christmas. They don't even want to celebrate Christmas. They want to like force other people to celebrate Christmas. Yeah. That's like that's the entire like and sell a bunch of product. Yeah. yeah, that's the entire yeah, mentality that... behind like right wing aggrievement. It really is just like not that I want to do something myself and people are preventing me. It's really just like I would like to be able to make or at very least nag other people to do what I want them to do without being told to fuck off or like that it's against the constitution to like you know make people pray in school it's the ultimate right. like you're supposed to you know their idea that you're supposed to be choosing to celebrate christmas with them even if you're muslim and jewish but you know stands that being reality which it isn't they just want to make you sorry also, ostensibly, the whole reason they, they're supposed to get upset over the war on Christmas is that Jesus is the reason for the season, right? Don't take the Christ out of Christmas. You didn't hear Trump mention anything religious in that once. In fact, it was all about stores saying Merry Christmas. It just becomes like a right-wing conservative aggrievement more than any sort of belief in a God or Jesus Christ. It's always about like stores, right? It's always about- right stores per se than it is about people who work at stores being forced to treat them a way that they want to be treated as a sign of like that's freedom for them like if the barista at starbucks doesn't want to tell you merry christmas because who the cares like that's, an, that's like an assault on your rights because you yeah. have the right to demand that like service workers kowtow to whatever you want them to do that's such a good point. Like this free speech emphasis from the right is always free speech for the bosses, mm. meaning that they can impose it on the people who work underneath them. So yeah, like the Starbucks folks will, like if you're a Muslim Starbucks person, you have to say Merry Christmas because Trump did an executive order. And Muslim. Now, yeah, exactly. Also, it's such a, it's, it's also such a, uh, honestly, just even like from the very like core of it, it's such a bullshit argument. Merry Christmas is everywhere. Like literally like, it, we joke about it, but Muslims and Jewish people at like like working at stores definitely do say like Merry Christmas and stuff. It never went away. Sure, sure, some places say Happy Holidays, but like the idea that it replaced Christmas, like it just Christmas is every year. Christmas is more in your face than the year before that. It's Christmas all around. Is this yes? The story. Yeah. Well, I mean, they've been doing this for years. We talked about this when Sam was on the show. Like, we played his old, uh, what was that, from 2004? The CNN clip. CNN yeah. clip. I mean, God, it's just, like, so, well, so tried. Well, Christmas is a useful vehicle for them, too, to, like, express their, like, constant victimhood status. Mm -hmm. But I think back to, like, Kevin Sorbo is exactly the kind of, like, you know, Hercules character who would go into, like, a Starbucks and throw a fit about them not saying Merry Christmas. And now he's going into Starbucks and say, throwing fits about vaccines. It's all about, like, <laughs> throwing, like, public fits over, like, not being true 
treated you the way you want to by like service workers and so like it's you know this just becomes a useful vehicle for like them to pretend like what all they want is like Christmas it's joy and happiness and I just want people to get along that's what the Christmas values are and it's like we don't even give people time off for Christmas basically you know half the time like yeah. other countries who like love Christmas like France or whatever like they give people like a whole like a whole two weeks whole months off of <laughs> off of work for Christmas and like we just go like eh, you should still be working but uh you know Merry Christmas right. yeah all right, also, let's... I don't know how I don't know how you guys feel, but this this leftist is a sucker for Christmas. I love this season. So these oh, conservatives trying to say that leftists are waging war on Christmas, you're wrong when it comes to this one here. I'm saying that, like I said this to Sam the other day, like I'm growing a little more disillusioned uh, as an adult now that I have to spend money on people. Like it was really fun when my mom would just get me gifts, but now that Wait, I have... You now have to spend money on people. How old are you again, Emma? Well, no, no. I... <laughs> No, like I have been, I have been right, but less <laughs> is expected of me. I yeah, can do exactly. smaller gifts, but now that I'm, you know, I'm what, I'm 27, I'm, I got a job, like I got to get gifts for not just like the immediate family members, but extended, my boyfriend's family. And I'm like, geez, this is like taking a real dent in my wallet. I'd rather just have Thanksgiving where we can all hang out. But I do like Christmas uh well, in it I mean, for its own right, typically yeah. the weather's good, although I don't really experience it since I moved to New York. But um, <laughs> I do love snow. And yeah, like I, I think there's some, first of all, like my favorite thing is to be uh, nice and comfy while it's uh, bad weather outside. So you can listen to nice. some Christmas music and uh, it's very cold out. And, like the nice thing about being in North Dakota is when it's winter. Um, you can't be guilted for staying home a lot, and uh, that's that's a great that's great for a guy like me who likes to stay home and uh, curl up, be warm, and read books and stuff like that. My favorite part of Christmas is probably the the Christmas music. I do like uh, oh, yeah. I do like you know old Nat King Cole or um, Frank Sinatra Christmas carols. I'm a sucker even for even like the weird like like silver bells like yeah that stuff is just great I'm i mean a, yeah no, no, i was gonna say i'm just a very flamboyant and dramatic person so like any shiny you know holiday stuff is going to like appeal to me especially like movies that have themes to it i would just say that the things that people value about christmas or theoretically value about christmas you know they christmas takes on i think a more important role in america because the things that people say they value about christmas like giving and like the holiday spirit and spending time with family are things that they're traditionally you know denied during the rest of the year you know and so like you can try to value christmas as a stand-in for having time off from work from having time off from like having yeah. to be harassed by your boss to go to like spend time with your family if you like your family i love you having know. time off from being harassed by sam and so you know <laughs> No, so like <laughs> so at the end of the day though like you know people should be arguing that like those values you can take with you throughout the year not just like oh well if we don't have christmas when am i going to stop being a piece of shit <laughs> <laughs> other people all right let's say it sucks sorry i, I, no, it's okay. christmas right. some more. Um, uh, I got you guys all sentimental i love it if, if you guys yeah. choose to on top of everything you just yeah. said wait till you guys have kids too oh, this yeah. season is even ooh. But love that's fun it. for love kids. No, thank you. I, you. I'm, I'm still kid at heart. <laughs> I no teen, no teen marriage is here. I really think we, <laughs> the, the problem with we take Christmas too seriously, and why I'm against Christmas is because it convinces everybody to take their lights down way too early. Like we got two, three more months of of winter left, folks. <laughs> Like, and you're going to take down the, the things that make it look pleasant just because, like, I guess Jesus' birthday is over? Do you have a tree in your apartment? No, I don't. No. I'm, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> I, like, I do. And that's what I was going to say. I like You Christmas. have a full tree in I the have apartment? I have a full tree in I my mean, apartment. Matt has to because of his kids, right? You have we a do. Yeah. We do have, we have a, 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 we have a regular size tree. We have a mini tree. We have a light up, like, sort of like decor decorative tree oh. we have yeah we got to do it it's got, we got the kids you know so they got to be all into it Damn, it's not i have a tree also you have a tree in your apartment bradley yes we my girlfriend and i have a, a big tree yeah my boyfriend got like a little rosemary tree from urban stems or whatever and so that's it and then i have put a few lights up but i actually uh well yeah i watched gremlins last night in french it was pretty good uh, but also that's one of the best parts about Christmas that I can get my, like, I can go, I can carry a tree around the neighborhood. Like, and people look, think it's weird, but I, I like to carry a tree home. Like, you know, get a nice, like seven foot, eight foot tree and just like sling it over my shoulder. Like sometimes carry like a baseball bat and like a Popeye. That's performative, like a Popeye performative masculinity. I would say. You actually just reminded me of another thing, Brandon, about this whole so-called war on Christmas, you know, for the, for the Hollywood liberal elite, they sure love Christmas enough to make it the only holiday with an entire film genre for it. Like there's no like 
large archive of Valentine's Day movies or or who knows what other holidays you could oh, think of, but Christmas. Yeah. That's the only holiday with there's my bloody Valentine, uh, Valentine's Day with uh, David Boreanaz, like all the rom coms that come out around Valentine's Day. Uh, but yeah, I guess Christmas is the only one that has like thousands and thousands of movies specifically about that day. Yeah, all right. and you can't count Halloween because horror movies are generally its own genre. They're not all necessarily about Halloween. I mean. uh, fair enough. I'm taking the call. Calling six four six number. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Six four six. Six four six. Hey, how's it going, guys? Hey. Hey, it's uh, Omega from the chat. I called yesterday, and then I, I was actually busy talking to somebody, so I actually had to put my phone down, and then by the time I noticed, it was too late. Okay. Thank you for the explanation. So, <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Two things. Um, number one, Inca Cola is fucking amazing. I love tropical themed sodas, number one. Number two, um... Because how you guys mentioned Christmas movies, what this is totally unrelated to politics or whatever. What's your favorite? Um, how do I say this? So there's a phenomena of like movies that were released in springtime, but they were obviously intended to be Christmas, like Iron Man, Three, Shazam. What's your favorite one of those, if you know of any? Movies that were released outside of Christmas that are Christmas movies that we like. Is was that the question? What, you're yeah. saying, like, there's one movie like that, Die Hard, right? I recently rewatched Die Hard. I mean, I've watched it a, a trillion times, but I recently rewatched it while, like, paying attention for the first time. And I was surprised by how Christmassy Die Hard was because I was, I was, you know, on the camp of whether it's a Christmas movie or not, leaning more towards, like, not really. But, like, it's really Christmassy. I've never seen watch Die Hard. It. You should watch it. Die Hard's a perfect movie. Die Hard is one of the, you know. I grew up with a sister. Like, we're in, we're in we're like, I'm not watching Die Hard. It's yeah, a miracle yeah. I got into sports in the way that I did. But See, I watched Die Hard after, like, I think in the midst. I, I watched it when I was younger, but, like, I saw it, like Brandon said, like, um, sort of paying attention as an adult uh, after I heard this debate about whether it's a uh, a Christmas movie or not. And I was, like, Brandon struck by it. Yeah, it's just a Christmas. It's it, Christmas-themed. Or there's Christmas elements in it. I, okay, so I'm going to reinterpret this question to be movies that are sort of Christmassy but are not necessarily Christmas movies. I would say then my favorite movie like that would be, like, The Shining because it's very snowy. Yes. It's like, it has, like, a very, like, winter-themed movie. It's like, I, I would say, like... When do they go there again? They go for, like, the winter. They go for, like, the winter. To me, if it happens during even, like, December... They you're, go for, you're you're going in Christmas territory here. They go for like the entire like winter, I would say. It's like a three, four month like stint. Matt's making fun of me. And it, like they only make it <laughs> they only make it till like January in the movie, I think, is like when, you know, the shit goes down. Anyway. Uh, somebody in the chat said kiss kiss bang bang. That's another one. Oh. Have you seen that? I would definitely go with Shazam because yeah. of the fact and I'm I'm a family person myself, so like and uh, my mother took in foster kids, so I'm kinda of partial to it. And I actually like the kind of like dynamic that they end up having at the end or whatever. I'm looking forward to the second one. I wonder how they're gonna work that one in there. But uh yeah, that's a good one. Um Iron Man three not so much. Uh I, I don't like the diehard movie, so forgive me for that one. I like the Iron Man three. It I was like okay. I like Shazam. I mean, too. we kinda got Shang Chi out of it, so it's not it's not the worst thing. Mm. That's the last one we look at. Last Spider Man. Is Shang Chi movie, good? No. Amazing. No, no. But, All right. What? Sure, no, it's not. I'm sorry. That's just. It's not even a good kung fu movie, which is like the which is the lowest bar it had to clear. It, I haven't amazing. seen. I haven't seen any Marvel movies in so long. They stopped honestly. making Marvel movies after the Avengers Endgame, and then they just started making <laughs> Marvel products. And so now, like every movie you go see is just like the same beat by beat thing. I actually still haven't seen Endgame, if you can believe it. I, the last one I saw was. Uh, was the one before that infinity war right that was the avengers before that it was all right before. all right i'm hanging up ralph i'm sorry <laughs> was a big letdown. there was a lot of talking in in-game and i don't know who was interested in all that talking but like infinity war is non-stop action and the like, in-game is like two hours of talking from, yeah. from characters like who is this and it's also like a, the big in-game it's like a clip show of all the worst marvel movies so like, they're like oh let's go back to thor 2 it's like what who has seen dark world since like 2011 people said this year Eyes wide to end. Eyes Eastern wide shut. Oh. Eastern promises long kiss goodnight are the best Christmas. It's got to be eyes wide shut, right? Like Marvin it, Jarvis. Says as that. far as like in a post Epstein world, like I, I don't know if there's a. I mean, what's that movie with um, 
Uh -huh. I'm, I'm, I'm two toasted lagers in, and I can't remember what the movie is. Do you um, like this beer, by the way? I love it, yeah. I, I really like it, too. It I, I probably could go for a second one. But yeah, um, it's a great movie. Um, I would say, on that list of two, like, I... If you guys are going to keep talking about movies, right. I'm going to go get okay. another beer. Well, definitely get another beer. I was just going to say to the, someone's point in the chat, because this is no, the first I'll, time... I'm going to use... The, oh, I'll read it. This is the first time I've ever seen the, <laughs> I've ever seen the chat before. Uh, you know, I've been able to see the chat while, like, streaming, and so this is a whole new oh, experience wow. for me. Wow. Uh, I would say, someone put Long Kiss Goodnight, that's a good one, with uh, Ash, with Samuel L. Jackson, and I want to say Ashley Judd, but that's also by the same guy who did Die Hard 2, uh, Rennie Harlan? Uh, so that's a pretty good one. Like he did like Die Hard to a Long Kiss Goodnight, Mine Hunters with like that's another good winter movie with a uh, LL Cool J, not the Netflix one, but the um the one where like they're FBI, where they're FBI um like profilers and like, they're trying to hunt down a serial killer. But I think an underrated like Christmas movie that I guess is really problematic. If we're talking about like stuff like that. Is the ref with uh, Dennis Leary and Kevin Spacey and I forget who plays the. I forget who plays the wife in that, but like the ref is a pretty good one. It's pretty funny. Edward Scissorhands is a great Christmas movie. It is, but I'm like, you know, I just watched The Nightmare Before Christmas and that one is really, really good and it really holds up. And like Edward Scissorhands is probably just a little too like, you know. I also recently found out that, uh, realized I should say that Psycho opens up with a title card that places it on December 11th, which makes it to me uh, within the Christmas movie time frame. Two weeks out? I, I mean, to me, after Thanksgiving, you're in Christmas season. People, Some people, people in chat are saying The Shining. Yeah, The Shining part, for sure. Yeah, yeah I, that up. I think that's a good one. Um, yeah, I looked that up too. Apparently, the Outlook Hotel season was from May fifteenth to October thirty first. So, uh, any time after any time after October thirty first to May fifteenth is the time frame that they were there to look after the hotel when it's closed. So he's definitely there for Christmas. Oh, yeah, no, I think the entirety of the movie takes place literally from like the November to like January, like period. Like it's only like he only spends that time there. And then like after New Year's is when like. <clears throat> I also like, oh, was it? I watch a lot of Christmas horror movies because there are a lot of good ones. Again, like Christmas is, I think, the one season where like oh, there's a lot of horror crossovers. Because obviously, Christmas is like the only holiday that's also like a setting besides Halloween. Oh, like other, ho like, other holidays are just less of like a real setting because they're right. more. I don't know. Like Thanksgiving is the setting as you're going home for your family, but Christmas is like everything changes. Uh, Krampus is pretty good in that sense. Uh, <laughs> Krampus was a good one. Uh, Krampus is a really good one. That is, I I, I recently saw uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night. That's a good one, and that's a really like that's like a sea level horror movie, but it, it's fun for what it is. Silent Night, Deadly Night is a classic. I'm, I'm actually going to watch. Yeah. That too. That's one of my favorite. Uh, the original, 1984 or 87, Silent Night, Deadly Night. All right, let's do a clip. Uh, if <laughs> the entire audience at this point. Okay there, Grinch. Oh, man. Am I the Grinch? <laughs> a lot of people aren't ready for this sort of deep dive into holiday movies. I'm, I just got to say, I'm impressed by how much you guys could answer that question because I blanked immediately on... I guess, would 30 Days of Night count for that, though? Because I watch that. It's not good, but it's... it's 30 Days of Night takes place during the, like, time in Alaska of the Midnight Sun when it's... I'm not Midnight Sun, the opposite of that, where yeah. it's just 30 days of, like, no light. I, I, guess, I assume it takes place in the winter. Exactly, yeah. I, I love how, like, I attempt to move on, but we still have more in the tank. Exactly. Sorry. Yeah, I this mean... This is the last show. We need to drain every... Every piece of cultural capital exactly. as we can. After I also Adam. watched Fred Claus starring Vince Vaughn <laughs> and Paul Giamatti. The one, the one where like Vince Vaughn plays Paul Giamatti, who's Santa Claus's brother, Fred Claus, and he's kind of like a scumbag. It's amazing what they used to make like back in 2000. That sounds and, like, familiar. Seven. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it does. It was, was not very good. Wait, Fred Claus has been on TV. I watched a little bit of it too. <laughs> Watch it. I definitely watched it. I just got my cable bill on my credit card, and I was like, "Why do I pay for this?" Why are you right. paying for cable? Because I, I, I got the MSG. I have to watch. If you, if you oh, pay gosh. for Fred Claus, I don't know. That's the, <laughs> that's not a, a wise use of money. DVR. I, I, I love know. cable. I know. I mean, I used to play for uh, pay f for Fubo, but that was like, I mean, I don't know. I, but this is another tangent. I don't want to get into. Yeah. Um, Elon Musk. All right, we're gonna do this. This maybe this will be our final clip of the day. I don't even know. Maybe we can take on the Black Masters one with this though. Okay, cool. Um, so Elon Musk was on a the Babylon Bees podcast. Is that what this was? I didn't realize that they had some yeah. sort of show associated with this. Yeah, yeah. Babylon B uh, has a a show which apparently has got to be just as funny as their uh, website. 
as yeah, their publication. Bab- Babylon B, the people who love to make jokes glorifying capitalists. Yes. So if that's what your thing is, check out Babylon B. People basically at the Babylon Bee, it's a right wing attempt to be comedic and also uh, uh, kind of counteract the onion Onion, and and other uh, satirical websites that they perceive to be as way too left, uh, the good satirical websites. They had Elon Musk on their show uh, and he has a strong opinion that one particular element in our society is just destroying everything. And we should be wary of it. And I was wondering if you could decipher this tweet of yours for me, because I'm not a programmer. You wrote trace route woke underscore mind underscore virus. Oh, God. What does that mean? Um, okay, so do, trace route is um, a networking uh, command to. Uh, they mean we don't so want to if you want to figure yeah. out a path to a particular server or, or domain, uh, you'd say trace route or in Windows, trace RT. Uh, that would show you the path to a particular uh, source server. Um, Fascinating. Either an IP address or domain name. Bottom of your file. And, and it, it would show you all, basically all the hops that, that goes through. I don't, through. I'm not um, far from and it. The, the, uh, the latency between each, each hop. And well, so. I know some of those words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so trace route would be yeah it would be like where did it come from yeah where did the virus come from what is its origin so did this work did this command work yeah, or no? did you find you figure read it out <laughs> read the, the comments and see you. and see all right it, it is a prevalent mind virus and um, arguably one of the biggest threats to modern civilization so I just gotta say when you have someone like Elon oh, Musk on oh I'm we, sorry go ahead Abe. No, it's okay. I just don't know if we like you guys were able to catch that or if you fell asleep uh, in the midst of that. But he referred to the quote woke mind virus mm. as quote arguably one of the biggest threat to mo- threats to modern civilization. Mm. Go the on, woke, Bender. The woke mind. Virus. I was going to say like this is remember this is supposed to be a, a comedy show, being that it's the podcast for a comedy website. And when you have someone that dry on, you're literally like they're literally setting you up for everything you could ever ask for if you even have uh, even a minutely comedic mind and they just let him go on and don't say anything because i assume they too have nothing to say because they're not very funny yeah i mean the like the, the um the thing where they have him define the trace route like honestly like the world's largest um uh <laughs> I was say jacking off motion, um, <laughs> hand motion. Like, just give me a break. How about define woke mind virus? What woke means? Because I, I like depending on the definition there, I have some uh, answers to where that might have came from. It might have came from like just historical facts. Like, why is a capitalist? Um, whose dad speculated in uh, emerald mines in uh, Southern Africa. Uh, why does he have the ability to decide things like uh, how public transportation in multiple municipalities in America? Um, it's because he's exploited a whole bunch of labor and um, and and has a position society that, frankly, I think is unwarranted. Well, like, talk about a mind virus. I mean, his entire ideology is one of, like, bizarre libertarian capitalism that's like a as virusy as it gets that it's naturalizes effect. it as all meritocratic and not like the product of um the uh, exact centuries emerald mines that you talk about yeah, yeah right and yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, you can tell that from like the, you don't need to define mine woke virus or whatever, but you have to define like a JavaScript command or whatever the <laughs> fuck he was saying. Because ultimately they have, they, you know, the whole woke thing just enters into a black box in far right circles to become like just a stand in for whatever, you know, gre- agreement you have today, whether it's Donald Trump being kicked off of Twitter for like spreading vaccine propaganda or, you know, fomenting civil unrest or because like the Eternals have a gay couple in it. So like any like thing that you don't like on the far right, it's some kind of like woke mind virus. Yeah. Also, um, it looks like uh, there's an Austin American Statesman article here. Elon Musk says he lives in a five hundred or fifty thousand dollar tiny morning. home. Is this he morning. actually living at a friend's mansion in Austin? <laughs> And yeah, it's just like, I mean, who would, uh, I mean, this is so shocking. If I thought Elon was staying in a small shack that probably had limited tax liabilities in rural Austin somewhere, but it turns out he might be staying at a a billionaire uh, friend's home in Austin where uh, they have offices and stuff like that. So uh, weird. And it it turned like, 
I mean, I would just think like I'm, I bet Babylon B probably ran some stuff about how look at this small house Elon is living in, and it's like actually living uh, next to a river. A lot uh, of billion. Although I'm sure Babylon B also, and I I think I remember it ran satirical pieces about Bernie Sanders's three properties, but you know that we're gonna take Elon Musk's like probably investment purchase just so he can say that he lives in the fifty thousand dollar shack and never actually set, sets foot in it um we're gonna take that at complete face value while he has like uh you know probably a bunch of other properties that he's able to yeah live at. and he i said so just real quick but i said that us american statements that was a report uh, according to a report by the Wall Street Journal, the billionaire has been living for as much as the past year in a mansion on Lake Austin, owned mm. by Lake Austin, of course, the uh, lake where a bunch of uh, Trump uh, boaters for Trump went <laughs> capsized in a giant boat rally because uh, they were too many boats on the lake going too fast and it caused whirlpools and the Beautiful. boats couldn't handle it. Now, you know, to that point, uh, I think for the most part. Elon Musk is deeply unimpressive whenever I hear him speak or like actually hear him express ideas himself. And yeah. the whole virus is the entire culture that we have that, you know, encourages people to treat people like Elon Musk because they tick a few like signifiers of like intelligence and a few signifiers of like, you know, what it means to be a good civil citizen to like ignore every other part of it. Like he, because Absolutely. he apps, operates like a, you know, Tony Stark-esque billionaire type that they're familiar with, with like, you know, from many of our cultural artifacts, people just overlook how, you know, terrible and also not very smart he is. I have to correct myself. It wasn't like Austin. It was like Travis. Sorry. Also, if I recall, like the whole PR push around his, uh, his, squalid livings uh he was apparently like they were apparently like pretending he was working like off campus live i'm sorry living off campus in like some sort of like mobile like home of mini home of the future that only costs like fifty thousand bucks or something only again but uh the actual house is like a nice like even the, the small house is like a nice regular classic style like nice sized normal person house he's trying but, to like so he, style himself as some sort of like henry david thoreau-esque type of billionaire you see right. Elon Musk is like a tech genius wizard uh cyber wizard so he actually lives in the back of optimus prime <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little trailer that optimus prime drags around with him when he's in like car mode that's where elon musk lives. that's where like his container home is and, you know all of the other things you see to the contrary are just like your imagination because he's saving the world with uh a jet i'm sorry what uh low orbit flight and a <laughs> thruster system that doesn't actually work very well apparently yeah. all i can say after watching that clip is that uh you know uh conservatives are getting better at comedy and we're the left is starting to get very nervous about it i think comedy's overrated you know, <laughs> i'm not gonna surprise anyone who listens to my podcast or me on this podcast but i think being funny is an overrated quality you know, I think we should abolish it. Glad you said that when Sam wasn't around. Oh. Coming out pro-Christmas and anti-comedy. I know. Your time here is limited. <laughs> what I changed my name from Sam Cedar under the thing. Like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this can't go on under the I was gonna say Sam Cedar Sam, I was going to say opposite Sam Cedar, but like, you know, people might have taken that too literally. Should we do the Black Masters a follow-up? Sure. So Why don't you I'll, introduce I'll, it? I'll just introduce this a little yes. bit. So Black Masters... We hear a lot about how we need a cross-partisan, uh, you know, um, approach to take on the elites. So we need to not just look at like the say the squad of them, but we need to look at keep a close eye on any sort of Republicans that might want to take on entrenched power with us. And I've seen plenty of uh, of uh, folks like on Greenwald promote people like Blake Masters here, or other uh, Peter Thiel associate candidates with uh, um, free uh, contributions of of publicity. And let's just take a look at what we're uh, signing up for, what our allies in uh, this fight against elites are. Um, Blake Masters here with Tucker Carlson. If you're Nancy Pelosi and you're already one of the richest people in the country and you're Speaker of the House at the age of 81, what's, what's kind of the point? I mean, why wouldn't she just stop doing this voluntarily? What does that tell us about her? That is, stop it, Bradley. Well, it tells us. But that thing, why wouldn't she do this voluntarily? Is Tucker Carlson making what should be a widespread uh, thing where we decide, yeah, you don't get to hold stock if you're a, a representative and making it about Nancy Pelosi's individual corruption. And that is not uh, going to be fruitful for anybody but the right wing because we, of course, know that every all these people are invested. And Pelosi, absolutely. Make her the face of it. We saw this with, with the, what, 
what's her name? Uh, Kelly Loeffler. That was a huge uh, 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 talking point and news story going into the Georgia runoff. And look, like if like I if Tucker wants to make Nancy Pelosi the face of this, look, I'm fine with making Nancy fine. Pelosi the face of this. But we can't be just about why doesn't Pelosi do this individually? It's because she's a capitalist, Tucker, because she believes in the free market. And like it's the, everything that your show promotes and everything that Blake Masters is going to promote. And it's the same reason he has someone on like Jimmy Dore or whatever to talk about, like just like the individual corruption of these Democratic leaders, because that yes. serves this exact like look at these elites that are separate from the exact project I'm trying to. Play and for. so this is protecting capitalism from indictment by making this about individual corruption. And yep. you'll see Blake Masters repeat that over and over again. She's really corrupt. And unfortunately, the problem yeah. goes so far deeper, right? It's not just Pelosi. No, it's so right. many left wing Democrats. They're corrupt and they're hypocritical, so much so that there are terms for this, right? Champagne socialist, limousine yeah. liberal. Look at Elizabeth Warren, who's in the news this week for attacking our country's richest African American uh, entrepreneur, a successful businessman who's on track to pay $12 billion in taxes this year. Yeah. I'm talking about Elon Musk, of course. And Elon has done more this week for America than Elizabeth Warren will do in her lifetime. And she has the nerve to criticize him. So I'm just sick and tired of this. And if you're sick and tired of it, you're watching at home, you're sick and tired of the corruption in D.C., help send me into the U.S. Senate. Go to BlakeMasters.com. Donate as much as you can to my campaign. I promise you, I will put an end to this. Well, yeah, I mean, well, we're sure, if we're really quick, I mean, if she's getting better returns than Warren Buffett is, is there some way for the rest of us to benefit from her stock picking prowess? I mean, she's a savant, obviously. She seems like she's got dementia, but no. How can we get, how can she become our CNBC anchor? Oh my gosh, well, we do need to retire her uh, from, <laughs> from her job. I mean, she's been in office forever. We need term limits. We need a new changing of the guard. These people. Tucker Carl is really bad at making that fake surprise face when he's like, oh, I can't believe Blake Masters can say this on my show. African African, <laughs> but he's white. Oh. <laughs> but, you know, I think, yeah, choosing Nancy Pelosi is a good vehicle to allow your audience, again, to fill in the blanks for what they want to view as the problem. Like, is the problem, like, from the Republican standpoint, a Democratic senator like Nancy Pelosi being a hypocrite? Or is it just like this specter of capitalist corruption that exists in our entire system? And in this case, Nancy Pelosi and other senators there's like insider trading essentially be with knowledge that they get at being politicians and they're just like you know the right wing is just not interested in that second part they're only interested in like the criticizing democrats for being hypocrites part and so that's why you can't give them air for it uh newsweek elon musk's net worth rose 600 percent to 175 billion during the pandemic so yeah 12 billion blake masters like I will say this, I don't know if that's more than Elizabeth Warren has contributed. Maybe it is to the to the American people. It is more than Elon Musk has ever contributed to the American people. Whenever Elon pays taxes, that's more than he's contributed than when he's. Uh, I think scamming. we can safely say that Elizabeth Warren has contributed less in terms of that. That when he's scamming million that municipalities to build bullshit tunnels, saying that oh this is gonna be buses, it's gonna get this way. Oh no, actually it's gonna it's gonna be for our cars and for a Kendall Jenner photo op in Las <laughs> Vegas, right? Like like this guy is an absolute charlatan. Any mu any any it, like i mean it'd be nice if we can get both parties um um to be on this board but at this point like a goal should be any democrat um uh local politician that's working with this charlatan uh, and giving him funds should be ostracized because he is he d actually doesn't prove what he needs to prove with regards to like um producing and the, like the las vegas thing is a great example of it i mean the only thing you can really say for like tucker carlson and his guests is that like they're empowered to do this by democrats and democratic aligned media who feel like it's their job to like run interference for the corruption of democrats due to like the larger system of like well nancy pelosi might be corrupt in x y and z ways uh, which definitely have a cascade of effects on the rest of like what she supports. But if she weren't there, it'd be a Republican. And so all you can do as somebody who is like not a fan of Republicans is to pretend or adjust your like sense of what corruption is to not account for these obviously corrupt things as opposed to like, you know, hold Nancy Pelosi or Democratic politicians to any real level of accountability. And so like, you know, Tucker Carlson is given this power by a lot of like platforms that refuse to make even the most basic individualistic uh, arguments about the corruption that goes on. But in reality, like that doesn't necessarily, you know, track with his history of supporting anything else. Like he just he just like points to like one individual who's doing a bad thing and then goes like, oh, well, like isn't it terrible that Nancy Pelosi doesn't support 
uh what is it uh you know insider and in, sorry um congressional limits on like insider trading or it doesn't like kamala harris doesn't support like the border security enough or whatever stuff and like you know they'll jump for one of the democrats will jump for that latter thing sometimes but not certainly not that former thing that kind of also shows where their real like politics lies in my opinion so in many ways they just give the republicans this kind of power and then on the back end they're allowed to choose which and what which criticisms they find as being valid and worth moving on yeah i agree and i think that's that's a good example of why like this sort of in my opinion cross-partisan thing is fruitless because what does blake masters emphasize that actually elon musk is really cool and unfairly attacked and nancy pelosi is just personally uh, a problem and that and in addition to these left-wing hypocrite democrats rather than just saying why don't you say this blake masters Representatives of government shouldn't hold stock in private companies. Yeah. Why not make a systemic argument as opposed to uh, look at Elizabeth Warren and Nancy Pelosi. I mean, they're both Democrats. And what do they have in common here? You know, this is, this is, this is some, something that you hate. Yes. Democrats. The same, well, because just, if he actually wins, he doesn't want to have to have to not invest in everything he's invested in. He doesn't right. want to drop his stocks and his whatever he's got going on. I mean, the guy is literally the uh, what is he like the the head of the the teal foundation or whatever exactly, yeah. um this is why yeah. the right wing, this is why right wing when they emphasize corruption it's like when they emphasize corruption for lava jato in brazil and uh locked up lula right that that's what the right thinks when and that's why they are not partners in any kind of liberatory movement and anybody suggesting otherwise should be treated with distrust it's weird though that like i mean you mentioned that you mentioned that the right wing is the one who emphasized uh that there was er, the the corruption when it comes to Lula da Silva. Uh, it seems like the person I mentioned earlier in the clip has a significant overlap with uh, with that argument. By the way, yeah, I, mean, I, I think Blake Masters. That's a right wing project by Dor. Blake Ma Blake Masters would probably suggest that Lula was corrupt and should have been locked up. I'm anyway. looking at Blake Masters uh, back on here. He's the same age as me. Jeez. Wow. Uh, he also met Peter Thiel at Stanford. Literally the same time period that I met Sam Cedar in front of the old Midtown offices in Manhattan for the first time. <laughs> Sam Cedar, who's that? Yeah, who's that guy? yeah man, my my life could have gone a very different direction if I had met Peter Thiel at Stanford. <laughs> exactly like normal people do. They all like all these normal people. They love to meet uh, venture capitalists at Stanford and. Working man. If you didn't have the good sense to meet a billionaire or be born a billionaire, I don't know how you could possibly blame anyone other than yourself. All right. Yep. Uh, let's read some IMs. Lori's guy. I think Brandon needs to be on when Matthew Film Guy is on sometime. That's a good point. Richard Wart's favorite snowy movie is The Good Son. That's the one with Macaulay Culkin in, um, oh my God. Uh, that other kid actor. I want to say when he gets his tongue stuck to the pole in that other movie. Oh, uh, oh um, the uh, Christmas Story. Yeah. Which, yeah, I, I've only seen parts of. I think of the movie. Radio Tech. Mean Girls fits the bill as a movie that isn't a Christmas film, but it takes place during winter, and they have a Christmas theme winter talent show in the middle. I mean, I, I look. I'm. I grew up during the time when Mean Girls was a bit, essentially like a, the Bible for uh, girls like me. So, yes, I would definitely, that would probably be my pick. Scott Schwartz was the kid that got his uh, tongue stuck to the... But that's not who I was thinking. I was thinking of Elijah Wood. Okay. Sorry. Elijah Wood. The problem is, the Brandon okay. just has way more uh, uh, fluency with uh, yeah. this sort of stuff. Than that. I know a lot more. <laughs> I watch a lot of movies and television shows. I think it's important to have a good grasp on culture. I mean, I, I think that's been made clear, Brandon. I just saw Mean Girls for the first time though this year. What did you think? First time? You can't be, you can't, you can't say what you just said seconds ago and then combine that with you just having seen Mean Girls. I'm sorry. I like to pave new pathways for uh, cultural exploration. I know a lot of people <laughs> watch the same thing. You know, a lot of people. What did you think of Mean Girls? I thought it was great. I okay, it was funny. there you go. Classic funny movie. I wouldn't say it was bad. I think great movie. I just had. I think it's it. held up really well, even though I mean, there's some weird stuff like in terms of like the racial divisions of cliques and things like that but yeah i'm trying to think about most of the teen movies i watch are either from like the 90s or like a whole like lifetime movie about like cyberbullying. so like i think in terms of like what i've watched recently i think it holds up well i'm like uh i mean i don't think it sh might sh it might not shock you to hear that i love tina fey so i'm a i'm a big into um i know you can say that 
that's a stupid position. It's all right if if you feel that way. I'm sorry. Yeah, we all we all like what we like, you know. We can't. Yeah. The faith work as I love Thirty be. Rock. I mean, I love. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I, maybe if I examined it, it's one of those things. Maybe if I, maybe if I examined it with the current like my current perspective, I might not feel the same. But you know, Skippy says Sutton thoughts on Below Deck. Oh, oh, uh, which one is that? That's a Bravo show that I haven't watched, but oh. my friends like it. <laughs> I thought it was a movie. I've never seen that one either. I might be putting up my list. Sorry, Below Deck. Let me see if it's interesting. This is not. This doesn't make for good live. You know, live. Uh, <laughs> but I'm always looking for new reality shows. Uh, American television series. I have never heard of this. Uh -huh. This reality series profiles a group of young people who work aboard yachts that measure well over a hundred feet long. <laughs> the crew members known as <laughs> yachties, like you know, like little yachty, I imagine. Yeah, uh, little yachty, one of these guys. Live aboard the luxurious, <laughs> privately owned vessels while making sure that their demanding clients' ever-changing needs are met. The Yachties, this is a long ass uh, synopsis. The Yachties share a passion for, this is not like, so I don't watch like reality television like that. I watch reality competition television usually. Like I got like, that's like a docu-series about people who work on like ultra yachts or whatever. I don't, like, unless there's also a few like, you know, in that I, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's not really for me. Um, Mind Pillow Guy says, I just want to quickly thank New Matt for su suggesting the podcast Death is uh, Just Around the Corner on yeah. the JFK assassination episodes yesterday. Such an in-depth explanation of all the context around the U.S. and the world and how it all tied in. Happy holidays, MR Crew and Sam and the Pistentia. Thanks for the great year. It's a great show. Um, do, do, do. Let's take, Wanna take a call? call. One more call. Final call. Ooh. Final call of the year, and Ooh. you are. Uh, I think I know who this is, and it, it, it's it's fitting that you're the final caller. <laughs> Kowalski, are you there? Kowalski, there's not a farm accident happening right now, is there? Sorry about that. As usual, I'm doing farm stuff. <laughs> yeah. <we're here. laughs> Am I coming in clear? I'm using a hands-free. It's great. It's okay, but there's some ambient noise. Maybe you could... But it adds to it, so let's... Uh... All right, just roll with it. What's yeah. up, Kowalski? All right. Well, I just wanted to give you that final agricultural report for the year. So I kind of have a pre-written thing out to sound like John from San Antonio. Perfect. Are you going to do... Are you going to try to do uh, John's voice? Um, I think that's... I am Reagan's. not a giga chat. Yeah. I'm... Yeah. All right. So, Keep going. All right. So final ag report of 2021. Um, so in brief, uh, the year started out with uh, the record surplus that was produced in the last couple of years basically being used up. And uh, that had a lot to do with uh, China burning through a lot of its reserves to fight the U.S. trade war led by Trump. This trade war put us into a uh, interesting position where we nearly ran out of our surplus to meet the feed demands for most of the livestock. China's also in the process of rebuilding its hog herd. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, a good chunk of China's domestic hog production got wiped out in a uh, pandemic of its own. So they're in the process of rebuilding that, so demand's going to stay relatively high. Prices have backed off from their all-time high over the summer. However, prices still remain very strong, and even with high input costs, the industry is sitting in a much better place than it has since 2015. Other factors such as increases and the SNAP program has also helped keep prices strong. That's pretty much where the good news ends. Looking forward or looking into the near future, it's not looking like South America is going to be producing an above average crop, which means the surplus globally is not expected to grow very much, which will only add to the drought pressures the United States, as well as South America, is facing. Prices remain fairly high on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange over the next year, which is uh, important to watch because they take into account a lot of these environmental factors and project what prices will be when uh, those crops are up for sale. Um, the issue with uh, high prices like this is that it will facilitate the destruction of the rainforest to make way for more soybean and cattle production, which is obviously not good. Um, looking into 2022, uh, it is expected at this point to potentially be the hottest year on record now that uh, the La Nina effect will be winding down, which has helped keep temperatures 
relatively low as the Pacific absorbed a bunch of heat. Uh, this will mean there will likely be record storms, droughts, and floods, depending on your area. It, it'll just vary where you're at. Um, this past year, which had all-time land heat records, however, surface temperature is obviously being, you know, absorbed by the Pacific. That's not expected to change. Um, there, it's a bit more complicated, but that's all that's relevant then for the ag side of it. Um, at the beginning of the year, when uh, prices began to move up, I made the claim the agricultural economy improved enough that it might deter the farm vote from being all that active in the upcoming midterms in the Midwest and the Upper Great Plains. I no longer think that's going to be the case. A lot of the uh, forums and articles I keep up with on Ag News has been talking nonstop about the inflation, and that is pretty much being solely put onto the Biden administration, being blamed for increased gas and food. Also, with extremely popular programs like uh, the child tax credits, uh, this actually facilitated a lot of daycare options in rural areas that will likely go away next year, which will add more animosity. And especially as a lot of people do not understand how these tax or how the rich tax cuts can remain in place with uh, those kind of policies will be blamed solely on the Democrats, even if the Republicans are you know, basically lying about their true positions on it. It won't matter, and it's going to harm the Democrats more than likely. Um, the narrative right now across much of the Great Plains and the uh, Midwest when it comes to the upcoming election is predominantly around CRT, deregulation, and taking away women's reproductive rights. All of these are awful in and of themselves. These issues, if passed through legislatures, which is very likely, will continue to cause more rural flight as young people, in particular women and minorities, move to cities where their rights are more easily protected. The countryside will continue to be hollowed out as the average age of the farmer continues to rise above, rise above 60 years old, and it becomes less resilient to adverse effects as climate change is creating far more problems. This will likely lead to more consolidation in corporate farms to fill the vacuum, which will likely be filled with migrant labor or gig-style work. Despite this entirely bleak outlook, I'm still fairly optimistic in the long term, however, because these state of affairs will force something to happen. I don't know when it will happen, but it's got to change because we are at the physical ends of exploiting land, water, and labor resources. It is my hope that uh, the 21st century will have some sort of homestead act that will help revitalize these small towns and reservations, which are equally being hollowed out just as any other rural areas, to help bring younger people back. Um, obviously, this would tie into my idea for community or co-op-focused uh, greenhouses on a county-by-county -county level to try to facilitate some sort of community center around that. I explain that a bit more in Left Reckoning if anyone is interested. And then, obviously, thanks for the great show this year and the opportunity to ramble as I am now on agricultural topics on your guys' platforms. I wish you all a very merry holiday season, and Emma, in particular, your addition to the show last year has been awesome. And in the rather male-dominated space that is political YouTube, you have been a force to reckon with, and we definitely enjoy your perspective, your interviews, and your sports takes. Thank you. Thank Aww. you. That's really sweet. And we always appreciate the agricultural report. However bleak it sounded today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, Aaron. I want to point, uh, we will be uh, releasing for everybody on our YouTube channel on Left Reckoning, our discussion with uh, Aaron on his, I mean, I can't get the idea of uh, urban greenhouses uh, out of my head. It seems like the, like a federal program that should absolutely be happening now uh, where you can go and actually grow your own food in your community and not have to like you know i guess like gig work to nebraska which is it looks like what probably will end up having to be uh you know forced on people but uh yeah thanks aaron yep you guys have a good one and i look forward to seeing you in boston oh i look forward to seeing you too See you there. Oh, yeah. Kowalski, right. Kowalski you just reminded me. Re reach out to me on Twitter. Someone uh, DM'd me asking to get in touch with you because they are planning on going to the show and they're from your area, they believe. And they wanted to know if you wanted to, if you were driving up there, if you wanted to go together or something like that. Right. Kowalski, DM, uh, DM Matt uh, Binder and Matt Leck flexing, calling uh, Kowalski by his first name. Yeah. 
That's how, I mean, wow. Um, now, I don't think I've ever heard anyone refer to Kowalski as that before. I'm, I'm shocked. I mean, it's just like <laughs> it was Matt, jarring. Yeah, Matt knows how to, how to show he's in the know. Um, <laughs> all right, guys, uh, we will read some IMs and then we're probably going to bounce. Uh, I lost track of the time probably because we are drinking beers. We ran out of beer. So. <laughs> Did we uh, run? On, the, on the note Kowalski ended with, let me get this in here There's now. It has been an absolute. Might be old. It's been an absolute pleasure uh being with you guys this past year every thursday and i look forward to it every week and i hope uh viewers enjoy when brandon and i join the conversation and uh looking forward to another fun year of doing this i i think everybody loves it i mean i love having uh talking to you guys chatting with you and i will say i mean i can't believe i joined the majority report right before the uh election last year um, my second day, I believe, was doing election coverage where we all, that was the only time I've drank with Sam, uh, where I think we drank until like one in the morning. And like, I, I don't even want to look back on that footage because I feel like maybe I was nervous because it was only my second day and I drank a little bit too much. Also, I'll just be candid. I hate election coverage. Um, that's why I'm always getting very drunk on it because I think it is, uh, I mean, particularly like 2016 was... It was brutal. One of the worst evenings I ever experienced in my life. Um, just as far as like ha having to be like, oh, this really sucks. And I wish I wasn't um, in front of thousands of people right now having to commentate. Well, I will say, I mean, when I was at TYT, um, I, on 2016, I was still an intern, I think. Yes. And I was outside of Hillary's glass ceiling party at the Javits Center. And, you know, obviously I was very... Uh, anti-Hillary or, or whatever, but that, but voted for her and, you know, wanted her to win. That was a more devastating night. That was one of the most, like, in, insane, devastating nights of my life. And, like, we would interview uh, Hillary supporters coming out and they were devastated too, but it was just like, I also wanted to shake them and be like, you guys are fucking idiots. But uh, that's a bit of a different tangent. I just wanted to say thank you guys so much for tuning in and you know embracing me as I'm still learning the community and learning how to be a good broadcaster and stuff. So I uh, appreciate it and appreciate all you guys as well, Brandon, Matt, and Matt. I appreciate you guys as well. You know, I'm obsessed with how like wide I look in this little box. I'm trying, you know, but anyway, <laughs> you know, wider than Sam it, 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 by a little margin. A lot more people are a lot more people are saying it. you can't even see the chair behind me. <laughs> it's like I'm floating. No, uh, it's actually been a very you know, not to say humbling is the wrong word, but you know, I'm very honored to be able to join you guys and uh, chop it up every Thursday. And you know, coming from humble beginnings of not being very smart or funny to where I am right now, which is not being very smart and funny but allowed to talk at people, is uh, you know, quite the quite the achievement. And I'm glad you know honestly that people have responded well to my presence on the Majority Report. Theoretically, I don't see any bad comments. I don't look for them, but you know, That's because cool. I watched the show when I was in grad school, and you know undergrad and I like to think it had a very fundamental hand in shaping my early political leaning so to finally you know I can see finally it's like been like five years but to finally you know be on the show in Sam's seat nonetheless uh I know quite, don't tell him you know it's, the, it's quite the honor you know and luckily my massive Living the dream my massive shoulders are capable of handling any kind of burden <laughs> humble brag humble I feel like I look lumpy a little bit but this is all right I, I Kids who are watching the show right now, just think in a few years, you two could be sitting right there in the Majority Report studio. You got the arm wrestling me for it. And I plan, I plan, <laughs> on, getting, I plan on getting a lot stronger. <laughs> All right, I'm going to read like five more IMs and then I am gone until January 9th or something. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I'm going to go on an actual vacation, although it's with my family so it's not that relaxing but we'll see it's less uh, relaxing but also um they uh cover more of the stuff so it's well nice that's the that point way. like i wouldn't be able to do it if i <laughs> right <laughs> um the only reason i'm able to go on this certain kind of vacation is because my mom is taking us um the <laughs> no, no i shouldn't say this <laughs> whatever N uh, nick from philadelphia the majority report is the best community on the internet hands down between sam willingly reading skating mean ims about him all of emma's uh lore and how incredibly sexy Matt is. It's just Matt. <laughs> Don't clarify which Matt. Um, yeah, I'm just going to assume it's me. All yeah. right. Do so. Uh, that was my first thought too, so I don't know what that 
<laughs> just a matter of time before the whole world is watching MR. Left is best. Rest in power, Michael. Happy New Year, everybody. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Chicago leather carrier Brandon was thinking of Elijah Wood, who was not in Christmas Story. I was thinking of Elijah Wood, who was not in the Christmas Story. The other younger guy in that is like Macaulay Culkin's brother. Oh, wow. Oh, uh, Kieran Culkin? No, Quinn Culkin. Oh, well, who cares about that? Um, eight cheese. I don't know what Brandon uses as a descriptor of himself, e.g. podcaster, social commentator, et cetera, but I think he should add the following. Watches all the trash TV so you don't have to. Many thanks for that. Love you all. Uh, have a great holiday and wait for it. Trump voice, please. Merry Christmas. Thank you, eight cheese. Merry Christmas. Uh, Pirate Tom Hartman. Trump said vaccines cause Hartman. Uh, it's got Hartman. Um, Trump said vaccines cause autism back in the 2016 primary. Did he actually say that? I don't remember that, but I mean, plausible. I mean, he was kind of like all over the place. Trump said a lot of things in that primary, and that, that's a little like, I believe it. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I do too. And Tim from Minneapolis says, Kim Potter, who shot du Duante Wright north of Minneapolis in Minnesota, found guilty of all charges. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, and the final I am of the year. God, I gotta pick one that's good. <laughs> Jersey Max. I'm just picking one at random. So I'm a Sixers fan, but please look into their new partnership with a Bitcoin. Random? Yeah, right. This is not random. <laughs> you pick the sports I am. It's not. This is about crypto. So this crypto is crypto. Oh, you okay. All right. I, I apologize. Wow. You Owned on the final know. show of the year. <laughs> you spoke too soon. Jersey Max, so I'm a Sixers fan, but please look into the new partnership with a Bitcoin NFT metaverse company. The rights to Ricky Sanchez's podcast went over it pretty well. Uh, it's very interesting and also pretty funny. This is different than their partnership with Crypto.com. Okay. Well, that sounds interesting. It's clear that all these, pl these uh, places are doing these partnerships because they... I want to free us from the uh, the oppression of capitalism. Right, that's totally what this is about. I looked it up, and Donald Trump has claimed that vaccines can cause autism. I would imagine that that was also part of, like, you know, he came to that kind of, like, knowledge via, like, his time as, like, a birther in the, all the various conspiracy theory groups that were, like, navigating that uh, landscape in 2012 to 14. Listen, folks, the three vaccines I helped create, I made sure they included the anti-autism serum. <laughs> no, no no autism in my vaccines folks all right guys that's it won't see you for a while spirit happy from... holidays Mer merry christmas yeah, happy merry new year as we have to say now because trump yeah. won <laughs> although biden's president now so and now we say allah akbar now we say uh, <laughs> now we say, let's go brandon instead of merry christmas we say Everyone says, let's go, Brandon, which I've been appreciating. Merry, Merry Christmas, Brandon. How about that? That can bring us everyone together. Hey, what's, what's everyone's New Year's resolution? Let's go Christmas. How about we split the difference? Oh, yeah, New Year's, maybe, we should, maybe we should end on New Year's resolutions. Let's do that. Go, let's go around. Yeah. Uh, Who wants to start? <laughs> um, I'm trying to be more regular on uh, left uh, literary hangover episodes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be better about finishing books when I start them. Uh -huh. Matt, I'll go with uh, start a new cryptocurrency podcast. Show. <laughs> I want to be better about being more, uh, I guess, deliberate and meaningful in how I go after achieving the goals that I set for myself, and also in healthier ways, so I don't become more become overwhelmed or anything. That's, that's wow, like, that's really well adjusted. <laughs> yeah. well, actually, you go fuck yourself. I'm trying to become more well adjusted. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's why I've been tweeting less. Uh, <laughs> also, they shadow banned. Maybe I should tweet less. That'll also be my New Year's resolution. All right, guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful holiday and happy New Year. See you next year, folks. See you next year. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I get somewhere the choice is where you don't get paid for the road that 
I get some 